Hello, good morning, good afternoon. I can see in the chat that some people have having difficulties to hear any sound. There was no sound, I think, until now. So please indicate in the chat if you still have difficulties. Otherwise, I think we should start. It's 2 p.m. We have our two keynote speakers who have joined us. So let's start the event on time. OK. So can I ask you to actually uh, mute your microphone and your video when you are not speaking? Well, your video, you can leave it on <laughs> if you are a speaker. But otherwise, please mute your mic when you are not uh, speaking. And uh, we have a chat function that you can use anytime to uh, ask questions. Or to uh, yes, to or to indicate anything on the chat box, uh, and we will do our best to actually um, address your queries. So, so let's start. First of all, um, I think. Uh, well, let me introduce myself. My name is Soraya Smaoun. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I will be your facilitator for this first high-level welcome segment of our workshop today. I'm actually le leading UNEP's effort on, on air quality. So really trying to put together a coherent framework of uh, intervention of UNEP on air, whether it comes from science, whether it comes from a technology angle, policy angle, awareness raising, you name them. Um, I'm very, very um, happy and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all today for this event. The number of participants registered, which was approximately 300 across a wide variety of stakeholders from governments, civil society, road agencies and academia, is a great indicator of the importance of air quality and walking and cycling agenda in Africa and beyond. I'm excited to particularly welcome our two keynote speakers for this event. We are honored to count with the presence of Major General Mohamed Abdelah Badi, Director General of the Nairobi Metropolitan Services, and Her Excellency Dagwamit Moges Bekele, and excuse me if I don't pronounce your name right, Minister of Transport, Ethiopia. Both countries and also some of their cities are leading excellent work on addressing air pollution through, among others, non-motorized transport plans or policies. We will hear from them both in a minute. So today's workshop on the business case for investing and working in, in East Africa 
brings, as I was maybe saying at the beginning, two agendas that are very close to our hearts in UNEP, the air quality agenda and the non-motorized transport agenda. As you know, air pollution represents the single largest environmental risk to human health and the economy. Exposure to air pollution causes an estimated 7 million premature death annually. In addition to the tremendous impact on human health, some air pollutants also affect ecosystem, threaten food and water security, and contribute to climate change. It also tremendously affects the most vulnerable. Global urban air pollution levels have also increased by 8% in annual mean concentration of particular matter, also known as PM2.5 and PM10, but I think PM2.5 is really something that is of concern, between 2008 and 2011, according to the World Health Organization, WHO. On the other hand, walking and cycling are critical means of affordable transport offering basic mobility and access to public transport. As zero emission modes, walking and cycling helped to mitigate greenhouse gas emission and harmful local pollution. As we know and can see every day, in many African cities, a majority of the residents walk and cycle. However, allocation of resources to non-motorized transport is still minimal and cities are not designed to accommodate the increasing need of of non-motorized transport modes. But when invested in well, the impacts are far reaching for air quality, the environment, road safety, access to basic services, livelihood, etc. So I think one of the main message and, of, and, and discussion that we could have today is really how to actually transform our cities and the way we move in our cities. We need to rethink the relationship with our environment. Even before COVID-19 lockdown ended after the first or second waves in Europe, cities began rethinking urban life. The pandemic really provided an opportunity to reimagine how we move and interact in urban environment. For instance, in the UK, the UK invested two billion pounds to put walking and cycling at the heart of their cities while Paris added 50 kilometers of protected cycle path and made three, sorry, and made 30 more streets pedestrian only. Of course, closer to us on the African continent, many cities have used this crisis to return their cities to people. And this helped reduce air pollution and also encourage to a certain extent social distancing. During the course of the day, we will actually hear from the cities and where they are in their journey towards active mobility. I think I'll stop there. And without further ado, I would like now to give the floor to our first keynote speaker this afternoon, Director General of the Nairobi Metropolitan Services, Major General Mohamed Abdel Abadi, to tell us about the experience of Kenya on walking and cycling. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I may start by recognizing the Ethiopian Minister of Transport, your Excellency Dagmarit Moges, Christopher Kost, African Program Director, Institute of Transport and Development Policy, Gilbert Patrick, Global Program Head, UNEP, distinguished panelists and participants. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to join you this afternoon in a virtual workshop on the business case for investing in walking and cycling in Africa. This is a very important topic for the African continent where walking and cycling infrastructure is not fully developed. I therefore wish to take this opportunity to, take the, to thank the Institute of Transportation and Development Policy and the United Nations Environmental Programme for organizing this forum to enable us to exchange views on the state of walking and cycling in the continent. It is my hope that by the end of this workshop, participants from different cities in this forum, myself included, will feel energized to do better. Ladies and gentlemen, the focus of my remarks will be on the state of non-motorized transport infrastructure in Nairobi, 
and the inv investments being made to promote walking and cycling in the city. Nairobi is a commercial and transport hub in the East African region and has potential to grow. However, mobility in the city is a challenge due to traffic congestion and inadequate walking and cycling infrastructure. Majority of the private car owners prefer using their vehicles to work due to poor quality and unreliable public transport system, as well as absence of safe walking and cycling environment. We are all aware that walking and cycling has numerous benefits. They contribute to growth of business as people on foot or bike tend to buy more. An example here in Nairobi is Luthuli and Mamangina streets, which were pedestrianized. The value of the properties along these streets went up and business improved. When residents walk or cycle, they spend more, they spend less on transport and are generally healthier and happier. These modes of transport are well utilized where city have safe, convenient and comfortable walking and cycling environment. This is what Nairobi Metropolitan Services is striving to achieve in the city of Nairobi. Fellow participants, I wish to state that the mandate of designing, developing, and maintaining transport infrastructure in Nairobi was under Nairobi City County Government and three road authorities, the Kenyan Urban Roads Authority, Kenya National Highways, and Kenya Rural Roads Authority. However, in March 2020, uh, Nairobi Metropolitan Service was formed to perform the functions which Nairobi City County Government transferred to the national government, which included roads, transport, and public works. The transfer of these functions gave NMS the mandate of designing, developing, and maintaining transport infrastructure in the county of Nairobi. The advantage NMS had was at that time, its formation, both national and county governments had developed policy and guidelines on this matter. Vision 2030, Nairobi Urban Integrated Development Plan and Nairobi NMT policy and Nairobi uh, Mobility Plan were all in place. All these policy documents focused on developing an integrated transport infrastructure system that is accessible, safe, convenient to all road users, including pedestrians and cyclists. Ladies and gentlemen, studies carried out on various modes of transport in the city indicate that 2.3 million people walk to their places of work or to places of social and amenities, while about 60,000 people cycle to meet their daily trips. These constitute 48.3 of all trips made by walking and cycling, while on the other hand, 51.7% of people in Nairobi use motorized transport. There are many more people who would cycle or walk to their places of work if more investments were made towards improvement of non-motorized truck infrastructure. This gap gives us reason to invest in the subsector. A close examination of African countries, infrastructure budgets, Kenya included, shows that the resource allocation is inclined towards roads for vehicles. Minimal funds are dedicated towards improvement of non-motorized truck infrastructure. Through skewed budget allocation in Africa, we have ended up with cities that favor motorized transport with undesirable cons consequences of traffic congestion, noise, and air pollution. It is from this background that NMS was formed and noting the disparities in infrastructure investment, 
we put measures in place to make a significant contribution. First, we identified key corridors within CBD to start with before extending outwards. We also came up with two colors to define the non-motorized truck developments in the county. Red color was for cycle trucks and bl black for pedestrian walkways. Whether pavement blocks or asphalt concrete is used. Within one year, NMS has contracted, con constructed a total of 20 kilometers of pedestrian walkways and cycle lanes. I'm sure participants from Nairobi have noticed a difference along Kenyatta Avenue, Windimbingu, Wabera Street, Gara Ring Road, Railway Ring Road, Workshop Road, Dunga Road, amongst many others. And many more are coming. Tender documents for some are being processed. In the next one year, NMS has set aside uh, Kenya shillings 1.5 billion to be invested to improve NM NMT infrastructure in Nairobi. Special attention is given on creating access to low income and informal settlements uh, and disadvantaged areas areas including Mukuru, Kibra, Kawangare, Madare, Korokocho, and adjacent areas. To achieve this objective, we are working closely with Kenya Urban Roads to ensure that mobility in such places is improved. Over 400 kilometers of road networks are being constructed to improve mobility. NMS massive investment in NMT infrastructure is driven by the need to create accessible, comfortable, and safe walking and cycle environment in the city. It is important to note that NMS is developing a number of public transport facilities as a way of reducing con congestion within the CBD. These facilities are well linked with the NMTs. As we develop NMTs, we have observed that traders, vehicles, motorcycle riders encroach to conduct business, drive, or park in these facilities. This makes it a challenge for the infrastructure to be used for intended purposes. Appropriate action is being taken and will be taken against those using such facilities for unintended purposes. Ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude my remarks, I wish to note that despite the progress made by NMS on NMT improvement in the city, we have not done enough. We still have a long way to realize a well-connected network of walkways and cycle trucks. To be able to achieve this desired network support, Partnership and collaboration with stakeholders and development partners is necessary. It is through these partnerships that we can create better cities that are livable, cities that we are all proud of. Cities that have good road infrastructure, public transport facilities, and service which are well integrated with NMT infrastructure. We therefore have a duty to invest in walking and cycling in all African cities. The time is now to invest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Director General, for this very insightful presentation and also for updating the participants on the state of play of NMT, particularly in Nairobi. And as a Nairobi resident, I've definitely seen and enjoyed the bicycle lanes on Kenyatta Avenue. I haven't had the pleasure to see the others, but on Kenyatta Avenue, yes. Um, let me now turn to another country in the East Africa region, Ethiopia. Uh, I would like to um, say that Ethiopia, of course, is moving to promote walking, cycling and public transport as congestion and air pollution continue to uh, worsen. Um, and I would like uh, you to join me in welcoming our keynote speaker 
who will take us through Ethiopia's investment on NMT, Her Excellency Dakwami Mojes Bekele. And again, Minister, my apologies if I'm not uh, <laughs> pronouncing your name correctly. You have the floor. Thank you. You pronounce it very rightly. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. We are now living in a world which demands more active mobility that aims reducing dependency on vehicle transportation. Many cities and communities around the world are encouraging active mobility with a view of reducing emission and ease of traffic congestion. Active mobility is not all about transition from one mode of transport to another only. It's rather considered as part and parcel of the economic, ecological, and social transition agenda that intends to bring sustainable development. As we are favoring active transport modes, world states are now determined heavily to invest in the scheme as it has multiple social, economic, environmental, and health benefits that may could easily that many could easily understand. Investing in walking and cycling is like investing in our best way to save planet Earth, which has been in parallel condition due to carbon emission and related climate change effects. Investing in active mobility is all about bringing efficient land utilization in our cities and bringing lively and vibrant neighborhoods. It's also meaning the reduction of transport costs and improvement of healthcare systems. Active reduction, active mobility is all about the inclusion of the disadvantaged groups of the society where elderly women and children could enjoy multiple of its benefits. And as, and most importantly, investing in active mobility would heavily reduce the road safety challenge which we have been affected highly. And above all, investing in active mobility is an ideal and most preferable way of expressing solidarity to mankind to live a decent life and safe world that we all deserve to cherish. Although investing in active mobility is ideal and sounds very great, yet the world still insists on using and giving priority roads for vehicles than roads for people. And one of the major reasons for this imbalance is related to low level of investment to non-motorized transport or NMT infrastructure and its related activities or services. In many African states, biking and walking in safe and comfortable streets have not yet become anchored in urban localities, as majority of concern regarding street is still favoring streets for vehicles than for pedestrians and cyclists. African states may have prepared national cycling and walking strategy or may not have it. And yet even after preparing robust strategy, we are grappled with the challenge of fully realizing the strategic initiatives through concretizing project investments. I also believe that the already existing attitude of road for vehicles mentality by itself may require a series of campaigns and attitude diversions, which require heavy investment by itself too. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, here in our country, Ethiopia, the majority of our people use, use, use walking as prior mode of transport. But despite the widespread use of non-motorized transport across the country, Ethiopian cities has largely been still car-centered and much of our grand land use plan and local development plans and their applications favor streets for cars, which literally doesn't provide enough continuous walkways and bike lanes. To bring prior attention to active mode of transport and to enable our citizens access safe and decent transport options, especially in urban centers, Ethiopia has recently introduced and implemented its non-motorized transport strategy through the Ministry of Transport Development, in, part in particular in uh, collaboration with UNEP uh, and ITDP Africa. And we thank UNEP and ITDP for their contribution. As to realize the contents of this active mobility strategy, 
we have established NMT stream committee and technical committees chaired by our ministry and one of the accountable institutions, which is the regulatory organ, the Federal Transport Authority. The steering committee is comprised of state ministers from Ministry of Culture and Tourism, Education, Health, Trade Industry, Urban Development and Construction. The committee has regular meeting in every quarter of annual budget year. And in addition, the technical committee members are comprised of technical experts from the Ministry of Transport, Environment, Forest and Climate Change Commission, Ethiopian Roads Authority, Federal Transport Authority, WRI, as well as ITDP, which has a meeting scheduled on a weekly basis. As for the national NMT strategy, we hope to build 430 kilometers of pedestrian infrastructure and more than 300 kilometers of cycling tracks in the main secondary cities of uh, our urban centers. In addition, the Ministry's transport sector 10 year perspective plan, which we launched recently, calls for 3,000 kilometers of NMT facilities in Addis Ababa as well as smaller cities. Construction of Addis Ababa's BRT system is ongoing, and we have also initiated plans to implement a bike share system in the city, following a conclusive feasibility study that we are carrying out uh, currently. And also currently in Addis Ababa, 70 kilometers of upgraded walkways and 41 kilometers of cycle tracks have been constructed. Based on the NMT strategy, we have also prepared a five-year period NMT transport implementation plan with the general goal to implement a safe and accessible non-motorized transport services in an organized and coordinated way on the selected cities and rural centers. This implementation plan has 18 major goals that aims to realize all the aspects required to aware, design, budget, implement, monitor, and evaluate the different NMT-related activities that we envision to see in Ethiopia urban localities. Among the goals, preparation of sustainable urban mobility plan and harmonized street design guideline, construction and expansion of quality and standard walkways for 69 cities and rural centers in Ethiopia, improvement of street uh, intersections, expansion of NMT transport corridors along uh, river banks are the major ones. In addition, the plan is also aiming to ensure adequate lighting on building, uh, adequate lighting on the built non-motorized transport infrastructure improvement of car parking supply and services, increasing access to high quality bicycles through developing a bicycle standard that provides services to all members of the society and establishing an incentive system to improve the supply of bicycle and spare parts are also among the major goals that we set. Moreover, the plan has additional goals that comprises improving cycle culture in schools and creating a conducive environment for cycling supply. The plan also discussed goals related to increasing public transport services through developing a mass transport service expansion strategy and development of a dedicated lane for public transport vehicles and implementation of BRT system in the secondary cities. One of the goals of the implementation plan, which is directly related to today's virtual workshop is the goal that focuses on raising funds to expand non-motorized transport across the country through, active, uh, through activities such as fundraising by submitting the implementation plan to financial institutions, that is lenders and donors. And also to enable Ethiopian Road Funds Office to focus on non-motorized transport and allocate necessary budget and encouraging city budget to focus cities and regional governments to focus on NMT transportation as the major alternative transport modalities. To conclude, as we were able to prepare and adopt implementing the contents of NMT strategy, much work and much effort is needed among the involving stakeholders as far as increasing the awareness and above all, identifying investment options to allocate funds for the study, for the construction, monitoring, and uh, implementation of the cycling 
and pedestrian ways that we intend to realize. To bring such investment, I believe local administration, regional state government, city administration, as well as uh, line ministries should come together and work in coherent manner to mobilize their own assets. So as to address active mobility. In addition, our accountable institutions such as the Transport Authority, Ethiopian Roads Authority, Road Fund Office must take bold action to address the demands and interventions that this implementation plan envisages. I also believe that donors and partners of the transport sector, as they have been supporting us in our different endeavors, we expect your active involvement to support us in this major concern to change our cities into vibrant role models of active transport that other similar towns and urban centers could benchmark and learn from. I wish you all a pleasant stay and a very successful workshop. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Madam Minister, and congratulations on the work carried out on non-motorized transport in Ethiopia. I think that through these uh, two keynote uh, speeches, we have set the scene very well for the sessions ahead this afternoon. Um, I assume that you all have the agenda of the virtual workshop uh, in front of you. This is uh, actually... Um, uh, already the end of uh, the high-level opening sessions of, uh, of the workshop. I'm very happy now to uh, give the floor to our partners, ITDP, um, who is going to introduce the business case on walking and cycling, and then who will facilitate the next panel with the experts from different institutions. So... Um, I hope that uh, Noor is with us. I would like to hand over the floor to Mrs. Noor El Dib, the Egypt country manager of ITDP. Noor, you have the floor. Hi, Soraya, and hi, everyone. So, Carol is going to share her screen. Okay. my views. Okay, great. So Carol, would you please uh, get the first slide? Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be here with you today and to be among us. Um, uh, the speakers that we had. Uh, I'm Noor Deeb, ITDP's Egypt country manager. And today I will be walking you through the business case that we have prepared um, that would show all of the country leaders and investors that why we should invest in walking and cycling and why we should start thinking of it as many other countries has already started, such as uh, Kenya or uh, or Ethiopia and why we need to pay more attention to to such um, important mode of transportation. So uh, to start with, I would like to show you how do people travel. We need to see how do people travel in African cities. So we have gathered different data um, for the mode shares for different cities and we found that almost 50% of the mode shares is about walking. So many people in the African cities heavily depend on walking and then public transport comes as the most second desired mode share. So as you can see, it's, it's a cheap mode of transport. People are just using their legs. So why not use it? And that's why we would see a high percentage. But do you think that the infrastructure is, is really there and like what, from what we can see in many cities that the infrastructure is totally unequipped to make the walking and uh, to make walking safe and, and dignified. However, many cities and national leaders have came, uh, have started to realize the, the need and 
for having uh, more walking and cycling uh, and that we need to really pay attention to it. And I'm going to walk you through different reasons from why for why we should pay attention to that. So first, let's start by seeing uh, one of the streets in one of the cities, African cities, and imagine what are we paying attention to here? So next, please. So as you can see that we have dedicated a, a very large space for vehicle movement. We have also dedicated spaces for parking. But if you can see what about the, the walking, uh, there is no a decent footpath. There is no uh, cycle tracks for people to, to cycle. There is no a public space where uh, people can enjoy and gather. And also there is no organized street vendors. Next, please. So can we just keep on thinking of how to widen our roads? Next. So widening our roads represent short-term benefits. It actually attracts more vehicles, making the congestion worse, and it competes with the public transportation and the non-motorized transport. So let's look at the benefits that we can have if we invested actually in walking and cycling and the threats that are arising from continuing uh, of widening of roads. Next. So first of all, it's all about road safety. Like 90,000 pedestrians and cyclists, there are 90,000 pedestrians and cyclists death in, in the Africa region alone. Like, and also the, the cost of road crash fatalities and serious injuries are huge. They represent around 128 billion US dollars. So can you imagine the amount of money that, we, we, that, is, that road safety is costing us? Also of which 50, around 50 billion is attributed to the poorly designed NMT facilities. So we would really save lots of money if we started thinking investing in NMT. Next. Next, please. Yeah, no, sorry, user expenses, yeah, you're right. So another thing for the user expenses, sorry, Carol, can you get back one slide? Thanks a lot. So we have found that the annual costs of the cycling ranges between 200 US dollars to 400 US dollars. By comparison that if you have a car, it would cost you around the driving expenses from 3,000 US dollars to almost 10,000 US dollars. So the cost of, of having a cycle and investing a cycle is, is really, is really cheap, cheap compared to having a car. Also the household findings found that the household travel, um, findings from the household travel surveys uh, found that transport accounts for almost 15 to 20% of household income, while for in a walkable city, you would spend around 12%. Air quality. So another thing that contributes um, to, to the walking and cycling is of course, the amount of air pollution that you have uh, from arising from cars and two wheelers. Like air pollution has been predicted to be the world's leading environmental cause of premature death. And deaths in Africa from, from outdoor air pollution have increased from almost 170,000 to 258,000 in 2017. And when you come and think about it, like if a person cycled one trip uh, per day more and actually drove one trip per day less for 200 days, a year that would actually reduce the mobility related CO2 emissions by around 0.5 tons a year, which represents of course, a great percentage of the average per capita CO2 emissions that is only arising from transport. Next please. Social inclusion has been another aspect. Like 80 million Africans or 10% of the population do have disabilities. That's why we need to provide accessible infrastructure because it would help them have access to different economic opportunities. 
Next, please. Another benefit is the public health. In fact, we, we have a dual challenge in that region that around 41 million children under the age of five were obese, were found obese. Uh, and at the same time that we have many people are still suffering from hunger. So a benefit that would come from public health is that walking just one kilometer per day is linked to a 4.9% decrease in the likelihood of obesity and also lowers the risk of heart disease. So can you imagine the benefit that we can get from just having a decent footpath where people can enjoy walking for at least one kilometer per day? Next, please. So during the COVID, we have found that many European cities have started having pop-up bike lanes. Like for instance, Bogota had around 80 kilometers of bike lanes, Paris had 50 kilometers of bike lanes. And when they found how beneficial those bike lanes were for the health and for the public and for many of the reasons that I have mentioned few of them, they started shifting those bike lanes into a permanent bike lanes. But what about the African cities? Next, please. So we really need to start like changing our thinking from giving the, the cars like a big portion of the street and start thinking in a more equitable approach by providing the other different modes uh, a, a good space in the street as well. Because as we have seen that most of, this, of the cities depends on walking and we need to encourage that. Next, please. And in fact, we have seen that many African cities have already started thinking of a more equitable approach. For instance, a city like Dar es Salaam, as we can see, that they do have uh, found, uh, this is a, a street, it's a complete street, I would say, because there you can find a street dedicated for pedestrians, a street dedicated for cycle tracks, uh, uh, another corridor for bus rapid transit, and lastly for the cars. Next, please. So we really need to start moving in, moving on to that direction in order to have a more equitable approach. So after, after mentioning the reasons, we need to think of how to quantify the benefits across the continent. So we have set up a model that compares the travel patterns under the business as usual and the sustainable scenarios. And that model, it inputs information such as the population, the growth rates, city sizes, trip rates, and different model splits in order to calculate the different uh, desired outputs. And it has been calculating the investment uh, that a city would require over a 10 year span in order to achieve a, a sustainable uh, transport scenario. And the outputs that we have got and that I will be discussing over the next few slides are uh, outputs such as the fuel consumed, the pollution generated, fatality rates, and also the number of infrastructure that we need. Uh, we have also uh, used um, the UNIP and the uh, Center for, Trans for Transport Studies uh, Share the Road Project Assessment Tool in order to, um, to calculate the emission factors. So for, for that model, we have focused on 188 of the largest cities in the African region, which have a combined population of around uh, 390 million by 2030, and estimated uh, daily trips that are being done today are around 77 million. And that includes walking, cycling, paratransit, uh, metro, taxi, different modes of transportation that I will be showing now. Next, please. So for the business as usual scenario, as you can see that the number of trips, um, like the number of trips, if you focused on cars, we would see that the, the, the personal motor vehicle use is growing around 7% per year. Also, the difference between the two scenarios that you can see that there is almost no investment that has been done in public transport and walking and cycling. It's almost stagnant. And also there has been declining in the walk and cycling and public transport shares. And the consequence of that is that you have more than doubling of person motor vehicle use in the next 10 years. So as you can see, if we kept on thinking by the way we're doing right now, our actually 
motor vehicle use will will be on the on the rise for forever. Next, please. When we come and think about the the sustainable scenario, it assumes a uh, like it's built up assuming major departures from the business as usual scenario in terms of the travel trends. So you would see that the overall growth trajectories in travel are assumed to be the same, but shifts to public transport and also non-motorized modes. So in the in the sustainable scenario, you would see that the, the cars and the two wheelers have uh, decreased and actually the walking and cycling uh, have uh, also increased. Next, please. So how can we get to achieve the sustainable scenario? The total, for the total population, we need to invest in around 12,000 kilometers of cycle tracks, 30,000 kilometers of footpath, 5,000 5, kilometers of BRT, and 8, 800,000 cycles in order to be able to reach to the sustainable scenario that takes other modes into consideration and somehow have like a, a cap uh, for the, the car, for the cars and this. Next please. When you come thinking about the infrastructure uh, spending, you would see that the, the results indicate in the, the BAU scenario, the infrastructure costs for the roads, it almost domin dominates all of the other infrastructure costs. This is because vastly more kilometers of roads are built than any other type of transit system. And however, in the sustainable transport scenario, the length of roads drops dramatically. Despite that around 30,000 kilometers of footpaths and the 12,000 kilometers of cycle tracks are built for 2030, it's barely visible since the investment needed is only around 13.3 billion, which is a very small number compared to the other costs. And when you come to think for every uh, million urban residents, you would see that for the BEU scenario, it would cost you around 725 million US dollars, while for the BAU scenario, so for the sustainable scenario, around 500 million US dollars. Next, please. Of course, that will also affect the, the fuel spending since you're reducing also the number of, of cars and two wheelers used. So we, we have witnessed that from, from the BAU scenario to the sustainable scenario, you would have 57% reduction in urban passenger transport fuel costs, which is evaluated around 43 billion US dollars. Next, please. About the road crash fatalities. Reducing the vehicle, vehicle kilometers of travel and increasing the use of active walking and cycling modes with, with decent infrastructure might be anticipated to reduce the incidence, of course, of road crash fatalities and, re, and it would reduce injuries. So from the BAU scenario to the sustainable scenario, there has been a witness of 60% reduction in road fatalities by 2030, which is evaluated at around 45,000 uh, per year. What about the CO2 emissions? For the CO2 emissions, we have found that also there would be around 60% annual reduction between uh, annual reduction due to the fact that we have decreased the, the car uh, and the two wheelers, which represents a huge, um, which represents like a huge uh, or main, main modes that produce CO2 emissions. And as you can see, also the, the decrease is, is huge. We have also looked at the local air pollutants um, at the PM emissions. So in fact, exposure to these kind of pollutants can cause you severe environmental damage and is really associated with increased risk of death from respiratory diseases. So thinking of a more sustainable scenario, you can, you would see that the paratransit is dominating the, the PM emissions. However, if we start thinking of, of new modernized buses that uses uh, a cleaner diesel, you or three or higher, or you would have like electric vehicles, you would find that the PM emissions would even go less in the sustainable scenario. Next, please. 
So, in fact, many African cities have now like live demonstration of actions that they have done in order to promote uh, uh, walking and cycling. And these, I'm, I'm going to show you a few examples that we need to learn from and we need to build on. So for instance, um, in, in Dar es Salaam, in the BRT corridor, they haven't done only like a bus rapid transit system, but they reformed the full street where we had uh, cycle tracks and decent footpath that were there, wide and spacious walkways that have improved walkability. Next, please. Also in Kisumu, they launched the Triangle Project, with which had uh, which has been proven that it really improved walkability. As you can see, the, the the footpath here is almost wider than than the car traffic lanes, which is what we're actually what we're actually looking for, because we said that almost fifty percent of the people uh, depend on walking. Next, please. So for also, as uh, the minister has said, uh, Addis Ababa has launched recently their NMT strategy where they were planning to build 600 kilometers of new footpath and 200 kilometers of dedicated uh, cycle facilities over the 10 years, which I believe it's a great strategy that we should all uh, learn from uh, because this is what we really should be thinking of over the coming 10 years. Next, please. So at the end, I would like to conclude that we should really start thinking of rapidly developing NMT structure on a larger scale. And also many cities need to start investing uh, in complementary public transport systems in order to accommodate a wide variety of trips. Um, another point is that we need to coordinate between the transport and the land use plans in order to reduce the trip distances in order to make NMT more viable. You would see in many cities that city planners are, are like directing their or having their projects in, in one direction and you would find that transport planners are working separately on their own. But we really need to think of how to merge uh, those two um, those two important uh, like authorities in order to be working on a more uh, viable NMT structure. Also, we need to think of adopting parking management systems in order to put a price on driving. Because when you have when you have like uh, very cheap parking uh, fees, people will be encouraged to drive more. Actually, also we need to dedicate fuel taxes and parking fees and other transport revenues towards sustainable transport in order of dedicating it to more of building more roads and bridges. Uh, finally, we, as po policy des decision makers, we need to repe repeal the fiscal policies that subsidize more vehicle use and actually encourage uh, people to, to cycle and, and walk more instead. And by here, I get to the end to, of my presentation and uh, thank you a lot. Thank you very much, Noor. That was a very uh, informative presentation. And the next panel will uh, definitely discuss a little bit this in more depth and in more details. But maybe before we move to the next panel, there have been uh, a lot of activities on the chat. So I would like to take this opportunity to maybe um, uh, address a couple of questions. First, to our keynote speakers, whom uh, I hope are still with us. And then to you, uh, Noor, on your latest, uh, on your presentation just, just now. Um, so let me just, first of all, check that uh, Director General and uh, Minister are still with us. Yes, thank you very much. And the Minister of Transport, Her Excellency, is she still with us? Okay, maybe, maybe not, but I hope that someone can respond on her behalf. So, Director General, there was a question addressed to you um, that I hope I'm going to find. <laughs> I'm sorry, just bear with me for a second. Okay, I found it. So, um, the question is from Ken Kanhia. Kanhia. 
Is the service, uh, so question to the Nairobi Metropolitan Services, is the service utilizing the prepared street design manual for urban areas in Kenya for the design and implementation of non-motorized streets within Nairobi? And I'll give you the floor. Yes, we, uh, when we formed the NMS, <coughs> we inherited a lot of documents uh, from Nairobi regeneration program that included the street designs, the NMTs. Uh, we had to surrender some of the parking space in order to accommodate uh, uh, the NMT corridors. And uh, the question was, where will you take all these parking uh, spaces that have been eaten up by NMT corridors? So now we are designing um, uh, parking, underground parking to accommodate the widening of the roads and of course the NMT corridors. Yes, so the street design manuals, we have inherited them from different organizations and uh, Nairobi Regeneration Program. So we, we have gone through those manuals and the specific uh, designs were created for different roads. So yes, we have accommodated everybody's suggestion while improving NMT corridors within Nairobi. Thank you very much for your response. There was another question um, to, for Ethiopia. Um, how the security issues will be managed as Cycle has no energy storage or engine to support GPS and other tracking technologies. I'm not sure uh, the minister is still with us. Director General, if you have any views, please feel free to take the floor. What was the question, please? how the security issues will be managed as Cycle has no energy storage or engine to support GPS and other tracking technologies. Yes, in Nairobi, we have incorporated the smart light system, which has uh, within the street lighting, there are cameras, street cameras. So these, uh, all these street cameras are interlinked to the security system so that we can be able to see uh, the pedestrians and the cyclists throughout their movement within the city. So the security is actually taken care by the cameras uh, incorporated in the street lights. Thank you. And uh, as you were responding, there were more questions coming up for you. So I'll just read them. Encroachment of the NMT facilities is a big issue that needs to be dealt with, that needs to be dealt with maybe with maybe better enforcement mechanism. And do you want me to read all of them or you want me yes. to give yes, you the yes. floor? Okay. And then another one is what is NMS doing about people and businesses that are spilling onto the pedestrians' walkways, especially on Gong Road? And finally, what plans have been put in place to accommodate, well, this one is, is to accommodate cyclists in Mombasa. So that's, uh, that's not Nairobi because we are having hard time when cycling. O yeah, over that, to you. The encroachment of NMT and uh, is actually, the two questions are interlinked because Encroachment of NMT corridors in Nairobi are by the street vendors. You can say business uh, personnel. They sell their uh, either fruits or clothes or whatever on the NMT. Uh, we had an issue because of COVID. Initially, we didn't want to, to use force to remove uh, uh, everybody that have encroached on NMT. But now we, we, we have designated different areas and put enforcement officers and given notice to anybody 
uh, that is uh, displaying their business, business on NMTs, they will be confiscated. So yes, we have given them notice because we don't want to use force immediately. After that, we'll be forced to use the enforcement to remove them by force from NMT corridors. So that is our strategy and we'll keep on monitoring to ensure that nobody comes and sells their wares on NMT uh, corridors. The other problem on NMT is uh, the border border, the cyclists using the cycling lane. That is forbidden. So we are now, uh, we have approached the county assembly uh, to enact laws that will find the border border people if they use the NMT corridors. So all these uh, are in progress and we hope we'll be able to control all NMTs within Nairobi City. Thank you, Director General. So I'll now turn to Noor. There is a question for you, Noor. Does the net decrease in investment going down the sustainable route also include the investment required in better, cleaner, cheaper public transport? Okay, that's actually a very good question. So yes, for the sustainable scenario, we have included the cost in order to build uh, bus rapid transit, which is considered as a cheap rapid transit systems compared to, for instance, buildings uh, constructing metros or, or monorails. We have also thought of having modernized buses uh, instead of many of, uh, I would say the the mini buses that are being used, but depending on uh, depending on the demand, we would have uh, better modernized buses that people uh, can use. So yes, my answer is yes. Thank you very much, Noor. And also, some people were asking about the link to the report. So I guess this will be, of course, shared once uh, the report is finalized. Uh, Great. Well, thank you very much to our speakers. I would, la I would now like to turn on to Chris Costs from uh, ITDP. Thank you, Chris. We can see you now. So I'm handing the floor back to you for the next session and, and the panel on walking and cycling. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Soraya. So I'm ha very happy to be with everyone today. Uh, I'm Chris Costs, the Africa Program Director at ITDP. And I'm very happy to kick off this uh, panel where we'll have further reflections on the case for walking and cycling. So without further ado, let's get into the discussion. Um, we have four panelists who are with us today, and I'll introduce them as they get into their brief presentations. So first, I'd like to invite Honorable Tofik Balala, the Minister for Transport, Infrastructure and Public Works with the County Government of Mombasa to present his presentation. Over to you, uh, Tofik. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Uh, sorry, I was uh, very close to another meeting. Uh, that's why, uh, but I, I had to, I know this was important, so I had to also attend this. So I'll try to balance between the two and probably I'll leave you uh, immediately. I reach my destination for my other uh, engagements. But thank you very much, uh, Chris, and thank you very much, everybody, uh, for having me on this panel. Um, I'm the uh, county minister for transport and infrastructure in Mombasa County. Uh, we are the ones tasked with uh, uh, all the road infrastructure and the transport modes uh, within Mombasa County. I think we might have lost the connection. Let's see if Minister Balala will be back with us. Yeah, sure, Chris, I'm here. Oh, now I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, great, thanks. Yeah, 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 Chris. Yeah, you wanted me to give me a, give a small brief, isn't it? You, yeah, you can go ahead with your brief and, 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 and Carol will also share your slides. Sure. Um, yeah, so uh, Mombasa basically is, uh, is a city with a population of slightly over a million people. Uh, in Mombasa, we have 33% uh, of the citizens who walk 
they go about their, their, their affairs during the whole day just walking. They never use any sort of motorized uh, mode of transport. Uh, they use their feet to, to, to move from point A to point B. We have 11% who use private transport, uh, of which only 3% own those private transportation. And 11% uh, of the population use uh, public transport. Um, the, we have only 4% who use uh, cycling as a mode of transport. Uh, obviously, the 4% is very small because we don't have, uh, we don't have corridors for cycling. The way Mombasa was designed over the years was, 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 was just for cars. We also uh, recently only started uh, a, 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 a putting a lot of importance on the uh, walkways uh, because in the past we never had uh, we never had uh, uh, we never saw the importance of walking, uh, but only started recently. Uh, I stumbled upon a report by the World Bank that was done a f some years back, and uh, we saw sense in in the study that was done. Uh, now, when the first, the first, uh, we decided to embark on on on, on uh, building the uh, footpaths, but we had many challenges, and the challenges were over the years, uh, a lot of the footpaths were broken and made into parking spaces uh, for the vehicles, private vehicles. Uh, a lot of the outdoor advertisements were also the furniture for the outdoor advertisements were, were placed on the footpaths. The Kenya Power and Lighting Company also put their electricity poles on the, on the footpaths and uh, we ended up not having footpaths at all. Uh, so people were walking on the road and sharing the same road with the, with the, with the vehicles. Uh, so we, first of all, we decided to now uh, 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 create the footpaths. Uh, but when we did that, we still realized that people were still parking on top of the footpaths. Um, so we, we knew that we, we needed uh, a lot of civic education and uh, change the change in the mindset of people. Uh, it was very difficult. And uh, then we, 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 we then we decided to make the footpaths red, uh, a different color from the roads, uh, and, and called it and called it the red carpet. Uh, whereby we were proving to the citizens that the walking citizen was more important than the citizen who drives a private car. And uh, psychologically, it started working because we also use a lot of enforcement. And, uh, and, 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 and even when you park on a red footpath, you psychologically feel that you're not in the right place. Uh, so that worked a lot. And uh, slowly but surely, people started respecting the footpaths and, and, and stayed away from them. Now, this task was very, very difficult because uh, when we allocate budget uh, for, for, for the financial year to come for roads, we have, by law, we have to go through a public participation. So we, we, we engage the public in the project that we want to do and take uh, their comments and views. Uh, most of the public, most of the people in the public were already brainwashed by the political class that any sort of development record by any uh, civil servant uh, or politician was based on the roads that they built and how many kilometers of roads were built, but not on the footpath. So even the people on the ground who even don't own vehicles and don't even use public transport were engaging us on how many roads we've done and they would want this road to be done and that road to be done. So we tried to, to try to educate them that, listen, we're all talking about the roads, but why can't we also uh, allocate some money for the footpaths? It was very difficult and nobody saw the sense in that. So we did it slowly uh, and, and, and we started with the CBD just to show, uh, showcase the importance and the, 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 of, the, of the footpaths. And uh, the public started seeing the importance of footpaths and then also we had to widen them to at least five meters wide. Uh, initially, they were about one and a half to two meters wide. But you know, when, when you walk with a group of friends, you end up walking in a single file uh, because the footpaths were very narrow. Uh, so to get the five meters, we had to eat up on, 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 some, on, on some roads and also eat up on many, many parking spaces. Uh, this brought us a lot of problem from the from, from 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 the of course from the selfish uh, population from the selfish percentage who use who are private cars, and of course you know that these guys are very influential. 
So we had a lot of problems. In fact, I survived an impeachment uh, in the assembly just because of, uh, of, of, of uh, things like that, you know, disrupting, the, you know, doing away with the parking spaces because we, we, we did away with hundreds of parking spaces and created the footpaths. But uh, slowly but surely, a lot of people started seeing the sense and uh, it's becoming better than it was. On the cycling, we have a problem because we don't have, the roads are not designed to give that extra lane for the cycling lane. So right now, what we are doing is that we're working with ITDP to see where we get the, the cycling corridor and we have identified a few streets where we can start uh, as our model, but eventually we might have to change some streets from a two-way to one-way uh, so that we can have the, the, the cycling lane so that we can have all, all the cars going into, in one direction and have one huge ring road maybe in the island of Mombasa and uh, that way we'll be able to have space to, to get that extra land. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Minister Balala, for those remarks. And it's, it's really amazing to see that journey that Mombasa has taken and how you've been able to convince a number of different stakeholders that this is the right way to go. And with that, I, I want to introduce our, our second panelist, um, Catalina Ochoa. She's the Senior Transport Specialist at the World Bank. And the, the question I want to pose to Catalina is, yes. you know, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Tofik. Yeah, so, at, you know, as, as Tofik was saying, you know, traditionally, the, the metric for measuring progress on, 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 on transport infrastructure is the number of kilometers of roads that have been built. And you know, traditionally, when, when it comes to development bank investments, a lot of times it's easy to make the case when you're, when you're building a new road, when you do the cost benefit analysis, you, can, you, know, you, you look at how much the cars will be sped up and it's easy to do that, that travel time estimate and, and then make the case for a, a road widening. And, and so we were curious to hear from you, you know, how is the World Bank going about broadening the set of criteria that go into deciding whether you'll make a certain investment? And is it, is it just based on, you know, travel time savings for the private vehicles or are there other factors that we should consider now? So over to you, Catalina, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Chris. Uh, I stopped my video because I'm on a hotspot, so I apologize for that. Uh, no I think it's better this way so you can hear me. Yeah. Um, do you want me to address the question or to go into my presentation? Happy either way. <laughs> no, feel free to go into the presentation. Yeah. Okay, yeah, but I'm also happy first. to answer that question. It's a really good question. Um, so let me see if you see my, let me know if you see my slides. Yep, now it's the there. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So, uh, first of all, thank you everyone for uh, this invitation, ITDP. And uh, I, I mean, the previous presentation was amazing. Uh, thanks, Minister Balala, for showing us that. Uh, so, I don't know if I can do a, as good of a job, but uh, that was definitely a, a great presentation. Um, I'm going to speak about a recent study that the World Bank carried out in Tanzania. Uh, which had the objective of understanding better uh, urban mobility in these intermediate cities and provide some recommendations for future policies and programs at the national and subnational level with a strong focus on intermediate cities. And the idea here was to, for the first time, make the case for creating a proactive agenda for sustainable urban mobility in intermediate cities, which as of now uh, was uh, inexistent. Um, and why the focus in these cities? Uh, mainly because these cities are kind of left behind when it comes to thinking about urban mobility. We typically focus on the capitals. Uh, and the cities are at a very early stage in their urbanization process. And we've learned that retrofitting can be way much more expensive than doing the proper um, uh, uh, transfer planning from the beginning. And there's also a, a short window of opportunity for the cities to, uh, to, to act. Um, because as, as we know, the cities would have smaller resources than cities like Dar es Salaam or Mombasa or uh, Nairobi to be able to do that retrofit. Uh, so it is very key that uh, investments are, are thought from a strategic pr perspective and that lead uh, from the get-go to sustainable mobility. So our report looks at many dimensions. I'm not going to cover them all. Uh, but here I would like to share like three findings related to non-motorized. One is related to model split. 
The other one is to uh, to reflect on the accessibility, which I think connects Chris a little bit with the question that you just asked me. And finally, uh, uh, one a, a finding on road allocation, which also resonates with some of the uh, things that we've heard uh, from the uh, ITDP presentation. So the first finding is on, uh, on model shift and, and, and based on what we've heard today, this will not be a surprise or news to this community, but it's sometimes not recognized for policymakers. And is that presently in these intermediate cities uh, in Tanzania, they have almost like an ideal model split if you look at it from many perspectives. Um, uh, and this is the numbers for Mwanza, but the, this reflects almost all of the intermediate cities in Tanzania. And what we see is the majority of the people travel by non-motorized modes, the vast majority, and a significant minority travels by public uh, transport, mostly daladalas, and a very, very small minority uses private cars. Like we see it's less than 4%. However, this is not as good as it seems, uh, because uh, what we find is that the reason why people walk and cycle and use public transport is not because they like it uh, necessarily, but it's because they can't afford anything else. Uh, in particular, um, in particularly public transport is quite unaffordable. I mean, not to mention motorcycle and automobiles, but uh, we found that uh, uh, on average, um, uh, Tanzanian intermediate cities spend 5% of their budget in transportation. Uh, and this is uh, this is pretty high, uh, considering that the majority of them walk. So actually, only 20% of the richest households spends more on transport than what is necessary to cover a two dollar dollar trip. So you can see how unaffordable transport is. Then the other key finding is that bicycling is really underutilized relatively to its potential and is obviously, or I presumably uh, lacked due to the lack of infrastructure. Less than 10% of the trips are made by a uh, bicycle. Um, and while this is at par with other African cities, uh, the potential is huge. Um, there's countries, as you know, where, where cycling can make up to 60%, like in Chinese cities. Uh, and it's also all the, all the reasons that were mentioned, no? uh, reduced risk of diabetes and avoids greenhouse gas emissions, etc. So, um, so the key here is that cycling is really uh, has a massive untapped uh, potential. And then the, f the final finding on this slide is that um, the smallest uh, minority of travelers uh, are drivers and they receive the vast majority of attention from government and resources. So there is an issue of equity here that we need to, to pay attention to as obviously uh, um, now majority of resources go to the minority of people and that's just not okay. Now, on, from an accessibility perspective, uh, uh, which is something that I think could complement very well um, uh, the study that ITDP made, and it also relates to the point, Chris, that you raised about uh, making the case for road expansion versus non-motorized. We conducted an accessibility analysis in the, in the intermediate cities in Tanzania. And for those of you that might not know, accessibility is now the key indicator that the World Bank uses to measure the effectiveness of public transport. So it's no longer kilometers driven. I don't think you would see in any World Bank project today, urban transport project, kilometers of road built as an indicator of uh, impact. Um, we talked about access. We have shift also from the other indicator that we used to use long time ago, which is a, a, um, the average distance to public transport or because also proximity doesn't mean access. So so this was a, a big shift for us in the in the in the recent years, and now every project has to be explained through an accessibility perspective, which speaks about the ability of people to access job opportunities by public transportation of non-motorized modes. So, um, so here I think the, the key finding is that uh, in Tanzania cities have still some decent accessibility, but if people would actually cycle, this accessibility would be dramatically improved. So here we go from 57% of access to all jobs in the city uh, by, by one hour in public transport to 76% of access to jobs if people would cycle. And this is quite striking. Uh, sorry. <laughs> And this is quite striking. I don't know what happened to my slide, but this is quite striking because to achieve this increase in accessibility is 
it would cost a lot of money. Uh, it would require significant investments in public transportation and infrastructure to be able to achieve an increase from 50% to 70% in accessibility. So that's a very important finding if people would use a cycling infrastructure, if there was a cycling infrastructure. And then finally, Another analysis that I wanted to point out was a uh, road space allocation analysis that we have in our report in which we assess uh, how from a, a, the a distribution of space perspective, some modes are favored over others. So basically what we use is we use satellite imagery to look at all the intermediate cities in uh, Tanzania at the downtowns. We classify the space uh, and uh, whether it was used for pedestrians, whether it was for uh, cars, for parking, etc. And we found that a, a valuable public space in, in, in central areas is allocated to park it. This was also uh, discussed in the previous presentation, uh, but we also have uh, numbers for that, which as we know has very low social return on investments and 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 benefits comparatively very few road uses. So, for instance, this analysis shows that um, uh, in cities like Arusha, parking can take up to 50% of the road space, and actually uh, 50 to 70% of the sidewalks in the downtowns that we that we looked at uh, were used for parking. Uh, so again, it's also about looking not only at the fairness in the distributions in the, of resources, but also in the fairness of the allocation of public space. So, um, so this to say that the business case is clear. Uh, Non-motorized is the most cost-effective way to increase accessibility and slow down the automobile dependency, uh, because this is the cycle that we're looking at. No cities that uh, experience congestion build their way out of it with roads, which prompts urban development along these roads, which encourages sprawl. People live in this urban periphery are too far to walk. Uh, then this increases the demand for motorized transport, and as a result, cities are low, have lower accessibility, which which hinders their their potential. And as a result, many Tanzanians, and I think this applies to other African cities, will be left behind, unable to afford public transport and living far from opportunities. So I'll stop here. I hope this contributes to the discussion on the business case and happy to provide more details on, on, on our study. I'll stop here. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Catalina. And, and that's a very emphatic case for changing the way that we invest. And I, I find that point about the road space allocation, you know, very poignant. And, and I think that's true in a lot of our cities that we have, in many cases, we have good footpaths, but we let cars park all over them. And, and so it represents a really wasted, in, in, you know, investment. And, and it's really a poor allocation of that valuable space in, in, in the downtown areas. So great. So let me Bring, bring up our, our next panelist. So I'd like to invite Richa Upadhyay, who's the portfolio manager for India at the Clean Air Fund to, to go into her presentation. And, and she's gonna to touch on the, the connection to air quality and, and why it's important that we invest in, in NMT so that we can clean up our air in our cities. Yeah, Richard, we can see your screen, but I, yeah, yeah. sorry, there, I now was I can on hear mute. You. Yeah, Great. perfect. Hi. Thanks. I was yeah. just saying thank you so much for inviting me uh, to be part of this really important conversation. Um, let me just. Yes, boss. You put me down on book. Great. Um, so I'm obviously going to come uh, at this conversation from a little bit of a uh, different perspective, though. Uh, not unrelated. Uh, just quickly, just to introduce the Clean Air Fund. Um, the Clean Air Fund is a global philanthropic organization that's been set up uh, to tackle air pollution around the world. Uh, we, were, we launched, we're a very young organization. We launched in 2019. Uh, and, okay. you know, in a time where the health impact of air pollution is increasing and the evidence around uh, uh, the health impact of air pollution is increasing. Uh, we're set up to sort of mobilize both health and climate funders, as well as stakeholders and actors uh, working on both sides, both climate and health side, to really sort of drive the urgency uh, to solve uh, the air pollution crisis. Um, we, uh, you know, we, like I said, we're a young organization. We've just started to kind of work and deepen our programming in three key geographies. Uh, so we work in India, we work in Eastern Europe, and we work in the UK. We're based out of the UK and therefore we have programs in the UK. 
Uh, but we are at a point where we're also expanding our programs and our projects to other geographies. Um, and so quickly in terms of our vision and mission, uh, where our mission, vision is to really sort of mobilize both government and businesses to take action. Uh, and our mission is that, you know, we, we would want to, uh, we want to create ways where, uh, where, you know, the, the, the case uh, for clean air is made as strongly as, as possible. Uh, and that, uh, you know, and, and that we kind of look at removing the barriers to scale solutions. We know that better air quality leads to healthier people and healthier planet. But what I think there is much less focus on to date is how it also leads to a healthier economy. And I think this is kind of the point of inter, inter, uh, um, intersection with this conversation today. Uh, because what we are doing here in India, and I think cities in India, like cities in Africa and other parts of the developing world, are seeing sort of very similar challenges in that uh, despite having a you know, large number of people who actually already engage in non-motorized ways of transportation, uh, the, the impetus and, and, the, and, and, the, and kind of uh, the, the, the power behind kind of, you know, expansion of, so only motorized ways of transportation kind of leads the conversation or leads policy or leads urban design. And so what we are trying to do here in India is come at it from a point of view of looking at what is happening uh, in India in terms of uh, the, the business case around uh, or, the, or the loss to businesses and lost economy because of air pollution. And of course, cities in India, uh, you know, um, in, in terms of looking at sources of air pollution in, in cities in India, particularly cities up in the northern belt like Delhi and um, you know cities across uh, 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 the, uh, the state of Uttar Pradesh and, and West Bengal, um, is that the local source of pollution is is really what makes people uh, unhealthy. It is what is people are most exposed to, and most you know high number of people who live in cities cities are crowded, and therefore uh, the level of exposure to pollutants are much higher. And the sources in many parts of these cities is because of dirty transportation. It is due to diesel and it is due to, uh, due to uh, you know, a, a sort of uh, uh, unrefined fuels. Uh, so what we wanted to do was kind of make a really strong business case uh, and a really strong kind of economic case for cities and the country as a whole to start moving towards solutions. Uh, so I'll go into a little bit into the, uh, the economic impact study we recently conclu concluded here in India. Uh, and the, the idea of this study was actually uh, to tell businesses that, that they are losing money and that uh, for them to kind of use this evidence to do more in terms of solutions, both in terms of kind of supporting policies, but also leading the way in terms of technology uh, and technolo technological innovation. Um, and so what we looked at was sort of six areas or pathways to calculate the impact of businesses. And these included labor productivity, asset productivity, consumer footfall, premature mortality, health expenditure, and non-welfare market loss. For example, people's inability to engage in activities like caring for the elderly. Uh, and I think um, looking at, uh, you know, uh, sort of coming at uh, this, this, the problem around uh, mobility in cities from an air pollution lens is a really effective tool and a really effective strategy. And particularly in terms of kind of getting businesses to, to, to start to take a much deeper look in terms of what was happening within their own businesses. So uh, the report kind of uh, unearthed uh, some really, really big numbers for us. Uh, the biggest one, of course, was that India was losing $95 billion annually uh, because of air pollution. And we calculated this through the six kind of pathways that I just talked about. And some of the outcomes or some of the insights that we got from that calculation was that, you know, pollution was one, of course, was claiming uh, lives of a, like close to 2 million people uh, a year. And these sort of this premature debts was also leading to loss of working years. And uh, that of course, you know, uh, calculates into actual dollars lost. So we calculated that due to premature debts in India, in uh, the country was losing 
um, you know, $44 billion uh, in 2019 alone. We also estimated that uh, Indian workers were taking 1.3 billion days off annually because of the adverse effects of air pollution on their health, amounting to about $6 billion in lost revenue. The study also found that many workers could not take time off. Uh, they would show up to work because they had to, but their productivity at work was impacted due to air pollution. It revealed that presenteeism, not just absenteeism, which is people are not able to come to work, but also presenteeism where people come to work, but they're not able to be productive uh, was impacting, um, impacting the economy. Um, and it was, all, it was impacting the economy because people would come to work, but their cognitive and physical performance was being hindered. And there was burnout and attrition at work, which uh, was costing businesses about $24 billion um, a year. Um, and so I think what is really relevant to this conversation today is the deep dive we started to do with, in cities themselves. We started to look at some of the big cities and the big economic hubs in India, like Delhi, Gurugram, Kolkata, and Bangalore. And these are cities where there's a lot of economic activity. Uh, and we started to calculate what was happening because of air pollution in terms of the city's economy. Uh, and we, you know, we found that Delhi was losing $5.6 billion dollars. Gurugram was, you know, losing its competitive edge in, uh, in the world market because a lot of multinational com companies were coming in into Gurugram. Kolkata, is the city, was losing quite a bit of money as well. Uh, it was losing about 4% of its GDP. And then, you know, cities like Bangalore was losing, where uh, they have, you know, corporate zones in the cities was, was losing about 12% in, in, in workers' traffic uh, because of a direct impact of air pollution. And so what we're able to do kind of by making a, you know, an economic case uh, of impact of air pollution is to actually go back to the cities and say, you know, you are losing money. And there, you know, we know that transportation is a big contributor to air pollution. And there are sort of clean, there are actions that you can take in order to start to mitigate some of this economic loss. Uh, you know, particularly, I think, in the post-COVID era, uh, no non-motorized transportation is, you know, is, 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 is really effective in terms of reducing crowding, public transportation, for example. It improves air quality and it, it, it uh, can help tackle global warming. Non-motorized transportation solutions also supports commercial activities outside of shops because people, you know, are walking, they're accessing shops much more. Uh, and it is a much more accessible form of transportation, public transportation in, you know, in, in uh, cities like Delhi and cities across Africa as well, because we know that a huge number uh, of people actually are already engaged in non-motorized transportation. We've already kind of heard about, you know, examples of cities across the world taking some bold action in this regard. London has put about $2 billion towards expanding infrastructure for cyclists and pedestrians. Milan's doing a lot of work around expanding their streets and reallocating streets, uh, uh, street space for cars and uh, from cars to cycling and walking space and Bogota doing very some, something similar. And so what we like to do here in India is take some of these examples that, been, uh, that are happening around the world and really start to kind of connect cities with each other. So there's a lot more learning in terms of strategy uh, that cities that are kind of already are going down this pathway in terms of uh, building non-motorized infrastructure uh, can start to show benefits in terms of health, but particularly in terms of economy, because uh, for the developing countries like India here, uh, you know, we have to start to kind of uh, un um, or divorce the idea that economic development um, must include, uh, you know, expansion of road uh, and that uh, and that reimagining cities where people can walk and cycle is also is uh, economic development. It's also a vision for development. And that level of narrative building work has to happen. And I believe that can only happen when cities start to see other cities kind of going down that path and, and uh, understanding and, uh, and adopting solutions that can um, uh, you know, that are transferable and scalable. Um, so let me uh, stop there. Um, I will Great, thanks so much, Richa. Sharing. 
And yeah, I mean, that's a really uh, compelling case. And, and those are quite striking numbers. I mean, especially this $95 billion annual loss from, from air pollution. And I think the, you know, the Indian cities offer a cautionary tale for, for much of the Africa region. And, and especially in Delhi, where the, you know, there were efforts made early on to, to try to push for cleaner vehicle technology, but, but then that was totally overwhelmed by the sheer increase in the number of cars in the city. So it just goes to show that we, you know, we really have to see how we can also get that mode shift to public transport and, and NMT. So with that, um, let me introduce our, our final panelist, um, Amanda Gabrano. She's lecturer for urban and regional planning at Makerere University, and she's also the chair of the National Physical Planning Board in, in Uganda. And she's also a, an ardent cycle activist. And, and, and so I'm sure we'll hear more about that. So Amanda, I mean, I think it'll be great to hear about the, the efforts to encourage the use of NMT in Uganda. And I know that, you know, we were all impressed by the, you know, the statements from your president early on in the pandemic when, you know, he, he was making the case that cycling would be a great way to, you know, to, to help promote mobility among, you know, amidst the, the lockdown early in the pandemic. So it'll be good to hear how you think we can, you know, build on that high level support to make sure this actually translates into change on the ground, you know, so that we can get complete cycle networks in Kampala and also other cities in the country. So over to you, Amanda. Thank you, Chris. Um, just before I came here, I had an interview with the KFM uh, here in Kampala about this chapter and this topic. So it's very Great. interesting that today is an NMT day. And um, Uganda is very lucky to have the NMT policy thanks to UNEP and uh, UN Habitat. The policy is actually more uh, being implemented from the working perspective. Uh, the cycling side is very little happening. Um, the pilot project actually came just before the policy uh, where we have the Loom Street and Namrembe Road, some of the images I shared earlier. Uh, it took 10 years to have that corridor uh, uh, have the lanes as planned and also the walkways to have a car free zone, the first of its kind uh, in Kampala. I think that was a very big credit to Kampala Capital City Authority. Uh, it took so long mostly because again, the business case, uh, the business community in that downtown area was so concerned that with the introduction of our NMT, they will lose customers. So we had to explain to them how they will make more money how their customers are not cars but pedestrians and, and how they might get even more customers who have not been coming to that area just because uh, it will have improved. The center of the project was uh, the improvement of the quality of public space to be I'm back. Can you hear me, Chris? Um, yes, now we can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You yeah. lost me for a bit. I'm sorry. It, so it the, the corridor. Yeah. Now we can hear you. The corridor was uh, opened during um, lockdown. Actually, that's when uh, the roadworks were completed and it was ready for use. With the green cycling lanes and uh, very nice, attractive walkways with good paving, high quality paving. Actually, Kampala really was very ambitious about it. Uh, during the lockdown, um, that's when everybody appreciated that the whole of Kampala um, deserved and required such a, a, a network, such a, a corridor, um, as you can see in that picture. So that's a walkway. And around this area, 
that's my other point. There was a business case compromise because the developer, City Oil, uh, complained that he will use customers. He will rather lose customers. And so there was a compromise. Otherwise, this whole part, this whole section where the cars are was meant to just be car free. Uh, so the access for this uh, fuel station, which also has Cafe Java's uh, eating place, caused a bit of that discussion where there was a compromise for, for their business not to be affected. But what we are seeing in the points where we compromised for business case, uh, we are seeing road safety issues. There is a junction slightly ahead um, where we compromised and allowed vehicles, it's very unsafe because the upper part of it is completely car free. So you introduce um, a big population of pedestrians into a, a, a conflict zone with vehicles at that junction. Um, the other aspect uh, was the social economic uh, aspects whereby we have vending. We had vending even before this corridor was uh, implemented. So that factor, probably, we were supposed to deal with it before um, designing this corridor. Because now the beautiful pavements, uh, the beautiful walkways and the bicycle lanes have vendors. Because they used to be there. So now, in fact, it's a cleaner and better working place for them. Uh, so this is making it uh, inconveniencing for, on a very good day, busy day, especially in the evening, peak hours. This whole walkway will be full of vendors, tomatoes, onions, um, you will see fruits, every merchandise there. So the pedestrian basically has no space. The cars are no longer a threat, but again, the pedestrian doesn't have the space. Uh, so that socioeconomic aspect is something that we need to learn from, uh, from the Kampala's case. Um, the other issue that came up also through the other presentations was parking, especially Catalina's uh, presentation. The, the, the park components, the vehicles um, are fighting for some of these spaces for their parking areas. And also when there are road expansion proposals, the, the motorists are also saying the stone street parking should give way for us. Um, so there's a bit of competition. So parking has to be factored in uh, when we are planning for non-motorized transport. Otherwise they are blocked. We have sections where cars have actually parked in uh, cycling lanes and uh, they know they even cannot feed properly, but they will park uh, anyway. So parking has to be taken care of. Uh, but the biggest issue that we have now with this Kampala's corridor um, is the, the connection to the bigger network. It is standing alone. Um, I think that's where the challenge is. It seems to be coming from nowhere and ending nowhere. And this doesn't encourage people. Or people may not see that it's actually functioning as one. So the bigger network connection is very important. Uh, it should actually come very fast for whichever city that has such a design proposal project in place or in the pipeline. The bigger network must follow as soon as possible. Otherwise, it kind of loses meaning and it gets a lot of criticism from people. Um, the other thing we are noticing is the drainage. Drainage is a very important element in the NMT comfort and, and, and design. Uh, we are having issues of flooding. You don't want um, rain to find you in the CBD of Kampala on your bicycle. I have failed to ride even today. I have failed to ride because um, the drainage is such a big uh, threat to NMT users. Um, people get swept into the open channels. Uh, they, they hit potholes on bikes. Uh, some potholes look like ponds, sometimes small ponds. I think this is something very major in NMT design uh, because it puts the cyclist or pedestrian at a bigger risk, uh, which we wouldn't want to expose them to. And I think in the design process, the drainage element um, must not be ignored. Um, the second last bit I would like to talk about is the awareness and the enforcement. Um, of course, people walk, people ride, but the pedestrians themselves are not used to having their own quality uh, of public space. They are not using to having a decent space for themselves. They think that they should be in a, a bad area. The car takes the first place. The car should have a, a clean motorway, a set, no potholes, but the pedestrian thinks they should be in that zone where maybe a car would be. So they, 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 they seem to be comfortable and they, they complain. So the awareness question has to come to show people that, look, you are actually the king. 
you need this space. Sometimes they fight the real good projects for pedestrianization, pedestrians them, themselves, because to them, a city is that that has cars, that should be seen with many cars. That's a good city. So awareness question has to have several angles in terms of road user behavior, the perception and the, 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 the status of a pedestrian or a cyclist, but also the policy direction. For instance, our NMT policy in Uganda, it's little known by the urban authorities in the countryside. They don't know about it. And uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, road infrastructure projects going on whereby cycling is being ignored and also walking is being ignored, but there's an investment going on, there's urbanization going on. So this has to really come to the know of, of these authorities. And there is also um, the aspect of public-private partnerships. That's my last um, bit. I think we need to identify how, how to give back some of these responsibilities, like maybe I can say a telecom company to ensure that this road space is used for just that, probably by having um, a kiosk selling airtime or whatever, and then they do some sensitization, um, not to leave it all to the uh, public sector, but also to engage the, the private companies in the process of ensuring that uh, this is uh, complied with. Like uh, the general mentioned, uh, we need to really start acting I don't see governments in Africa really interested in this subject of walking and cycling. And whereas walking is getting some attention, cycling is still not getting um, that attention that it deserves. So we really still have a long way to go. And uh, I commend all the cities in Africa that have started uh, taking these bold steps. I thank you very much. Great, thanks so much, Amanda. And yeah, I, I, I found those points really interesting. I mean, first that, you know, this, you, you can't, you have to consider the social factors when you're planning this infrastructure and, and not just take it as something theoretical. And, and also this, you know, theme that we've heard come up again, that, you know, even pedestrians are conditioned to be second class citizens. And we, you know, we just expect that we're always going to be at the bottom of the totem pole and we just need to get what's handed to us. So, you know, thinking about how we, you know, we can, we can empower everyone to really demand the infrastructure that we deserve. Um, so great. I, uh, in the interest of time, I just want to take a, a, a couple of questions and, and, and present them to the panelists. Um, so one from, from Heather um, about gender sensitive planning, and, and this goes to Catalina. Um, you know, were there, uh, were the studies in, in Wanza and the other cities uh, disaggregated by gender? And did you get any insights about the, the, the differences between the, the mobility needs and, and, you know, and the access patterns for men and women? So let me put that to Catalina. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, and thanks for the question. Actually, um, one of the challenges we had with the report was that was, there was very, very little data. So the analysis we did, uh, as this is such a, 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 a a new agenda in the case of uh, uh, Tanzania. In the analysis we did, we did make sure that there was uh, uh, data collected, uh, discriminated by gender, so that we could better understand the different uh, travel patterns of of, of the of, uh, women versus men. Also, so that was for the accessibility uh, analysis. But the reality is that, unfortunately, in this particular case of uh, of the intermediate cities, we don't have, for instance, origin destination surveys uh, uh, discriminated by gender that give us more precise information on demand uh, uh, on demand patterns of uh, of transport. We did find, uh, as expected, that the mobility patterns of women are quite different, um, and actually, uh, some of the findings uh, from our study point out the fact that women um, feel less safe uh, uh, in non-motorized uh, modes. Uh, women travel uh, in a very different uh, patterns as men. For instance, uh, they use uh, public transport uh, uh, not just in peak hours as the majority of men do, but also there's a lot of linked trips uh, during the day. So yeah, I can share more of, of, of these findings, but there is definitely a, a difference and I, and I need to uh, consistently look at uh, uh, gender differences uh, in uh, urban mobility. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, and, and we, we'd be happy to 
circulate any of the materials with the with the whole group afterward. Um, and then there, there's been some discussion about the uh, the, the Kampala case, um, and this question can go to Amanda, you know, about the the legal under. Pinnings. And, you know, do, do you have the tools to be able to do the enforcement of the, the walkways and, you know, keep vehicles from parking on them? Or, or is that an obstacle? So maybe I can hand that to Amanda and, 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 you know, whether you have that in place or if that's something that needs to be addressed also. I think that was addressed in the NMT design manual, uh, which is not yet out and, uh, and, and formal. Probably Claire could uh, uh, shed some more light about it and how far they've gone, or uh, the ministry has gone. But it's not catered for for now in the law because the cycling lane was not existing then um, before the NMT policy came into place. So in the current law, it's not. But it just makes obvious sense because they can't even fit in the lane. They can't fit in the cycling lane because it's about one and a half meters. It's about one meter. <laughs> so to find a vehicle speed in the bicycle lane is just someone's thinking that's again the perception because it's painted green yeah and uh, the person also has to park anyway there's a parking need there's a parking gap so what should that person do they have to park their car somewhere also where they see there's some room for their tires yeah that's a, a good point like you know first of all just make it physically impossible at least for the large vehicles to get onto the nmt facilities um, great. And, and then maybe I can uh, just lastly go to Richa and, and see, Richa, if, if you have any ideas about how to tackle this perception issue where, where even, you know, sometimes pedestrians don't demand the facilities that they deserve. And based on your experience in Indian cities, are there any lessons that we could apply in the Africa region for addressing that? I think we've got you on mute still. Yeah. There we are. Thanks. Sorry about that. I think what we found to be an effective strategy is actually to get champions to really own this narrative. And so, uh, you know, getting mayors in Bangalore, for example, to take on the challenge of cycling to work uh, and then connecting different sort of, you know, political champions or influential um, champions to actually embody, uh, uh, embody this work has, has been a really effective strategy. The other thing I know ITDP here in India is also doing is working with the ministries um, of health and transport to put out a challenge for different cities uh, to think about how to how might they kind of reimagine their cities mobility in order to really accommodate non motorized transportation. Uh, and lastly, I would say that uh, programs like C40 were encouraging cities to be healthier and think about particularly through a lens of air pollution and, and you know, some of the easier things that they can actually adopt pretty quickly in terms of not having to spend a whole lot of money is to think about repurposing kind of already existing infrastructure. And I think you know, there are some of those like early wins we can start to look at and start to build on the much kind of the harder wins after that, but city, for cities to kind of you know, adopt them, feel confident that they're working, that there's support from, you know, policymakers to uh, citizens themselves, and then move towards a broader, much more kind of harder infrastructure kind of um, uh, wins is, I think, a good strategy to adopt. Makes sense. Thank, thanks so much. And so with that, I, I want to give a big thanks to all the panelists. This has raised a lot of issues that, that we'll, I'm sure we'll continue to tackle in the second half of the session. But let me hand it back to Soraya to lead us on the next steps. Can you hear me? Yes. My apologies, I had to remove my video because of bandwidth issue. Um, thank you very much all again. I think there is, we are a little bit behind schedule. So there is a suggestion that uh, we will go directly to the poll and maybe skip the, the coffee break or the health break rather. Um, I might ask uh, Carly for some help with the poll. Carly, are you connected? 
Hi everyone. Yeah, I'm here. I think, yep, yeah, the poll should be coming up now. And I think the suggestion is um, please do the poll, but you know, if you do need to grab a coffee or a cup of tea or take a loo break, you can kind of do that and just come back. But we'll we'll keep moving through the agenda because we've got so many um interesting speakers to, to hear from and we want to give give them the right amount of time. So we'll keep going. And I think Chris is going to facilitate the second session. Great, thank you, Carly. So we'll just uh, fill up the poll and submit. That's the only questions that you have, or there are several questions in the poll. Um, we have two questions. Um, so we will launch the other poll as soon as we're done with this one. Thank you. the second question. Okay, colleagues, for the benefit of time and for those of you who are still connected or have taken your coffee or tea uh, very quickly, maybe we, oh, here are the results. Is bike share a sustainable option for short cross town trips? Yes, with adequate infrastructure for 65%. 11% said no, the cycling culture needs momentum and 23% maybe. There are substantial benefits and challenges, but it could work. Interesting. And I guess the second question, the result of the second question is coming up soon. Okay, while we wait for the poll result for the second question, I'm ending back over to you, Chris, for the last session of the afternoon. Sounds great. Thanks, Sarai. Um, so you. for for the next session, yeah, we'll we'll go into a couple more case studies. And to introduce our presenters, I want to bring on board uh, my colleague Claire Burunji, who is the country manager for Uganda at ITDP. Over to you, Claire. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, 
I hope everyone can get me clearly, yep. right? Yeah, very clear. Okay, oh, okay great. Um, thank you, everyone. Chris has introduced me. My name is Claire Birunji. I'm the country manager in Uganda. Uh, for our next session, we're going to go into a deep dive session. We, we hope that this is going to be more of an interactive uh, session, asking the questions. But before we get into that, I would like to appreciate um, what the previous speakers um, have presented. They have given very strong, compelling uh, reasons why we should invest uh, in walking and cycling. And I see that most of the reasons that are coming out a little more strongly is uh, the need uh, to reduce uh, road fatalities, the road safety issues coming out uh, a bit uh, more strongly. Um, I've seen pictures uh, on air quality impact. Uh, people want clean air when they in public spaces or they're taking their walks or they're even living in the cities. And uh, Catalina also presented about the accessibility issue. I think that's uh, a very important issue to look at it. Um, it, was, it was interesting to see that if you improve uh, cycling and uh, NMT networks that you can increase uh, accessibility to not only like to public transport, but changing their paradigm to access to jobs. So in our next session, um, we're supposed to have, uh, no, we're going to have um, a presentation from uh, Gasho Abera, uh, my colleague, and Penina as well, who's my colleague uh, in Nairobi. Uh, Gasho is my colleague uh, in Ethiopia, and we're also supposed to be joined with uh, Jacob Biamkama, who's uh, the director at the Kampala Capital City authority and maybe he would be in position to answer the questions that um, Amanda had posed uh, previously. But in this next session, we want to see how we can make, um, how can we bring this to a reality? How can we show uh, how these investments, how the cases can be made at the different levels uh, of planning, uh, preparing the strategies, and we shall also have the discussion on how can we see um, these arguments or these benefits that we have discussed before? How do we see them coming out at these different levels uh, of implementing projects? Uh, so for now, I will hand over to my colleague, uh, Gasho, uh, to take us quickly through the NMT strategy. I think the Minister of Ethiopia had talked about this, the NMT strategy for Ethiopia. Uh, Gasho, please, uh, you can join. I'll make your presentation. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Claire. Uh, Gasho, uh, just to note yeah. that uh, we are a bit limited on time. Uh, so please be a bit yeah. quick so we can have time for discussions with the participants. Yes, I, I will be so quick. Um, okay, and thank, thank you so you. much. <laughs> yes. No thank you so much. So yeah, much has been uh, said by our minister and uh, uh, and I want to say also uh, good afternoon and good morning for everyone who's joining on this meeting, depending on your time zone. And I can quickly go through the some of the contents of the NMT and much we will we'll focus on what has been done so far after the launch of the Ethiopian NMT strategy. Uh, so this strategy was prepared actually by the Ministry of Transport in collaboration with the ITDP, uh, UN Environment and UN Habitat. Can go next, please. So yeah, this is just to show uh, the uh, to introduce about ITDP and its work uh, uh, around the world. And ITDP's major goal is to promote equitable and sustainable transport uh, around uh, worldwide. And we have several offices in Africa and uh, on the other parts of the region also. So. <clears throat> The major, <clears throat> the major contents of the NMT strategy are basically focused on three different uh, issues. The first one being uh, related to the street design that needs to be changed in the city. And the strategy focuses mainly on creating a safer accessible footpaths and creating cycle tracks, uh, dedicated cycle lanes, and also providing proper crossings and adequate sheds, uh, adequate lighting, traffic calming, and space dedicated for driving and parking. These were a critical issue that the city was facing regarding the NMT zones. And also the, our building design was also our, another concern that we were focusing on our strategy, which we 
uh, promote on the promoting the active frontage along the streets and uh, <clears throat> physically permeable frontage and complementary uses and uh, also having a compact uh, urban forms. Uh, at a network level, we uh, managed actually to we recommended the city and also at the country level to have cities to have a planning that focus on a smaller blocks than having a larger block where people has to uh, walk a lot of distance and pri to prioritize public transport and pedestrians. Next, please. Uh, just to give you a background uh, or uh, information about the country's urbanization, Ethiopia is also one of the <coughs> least urbanized uh, countries uh, in the world. But recently, the country is rapidly urbanizing, uh, and the level of urbanization currently is around 21%. And the total population living in the country is somewhere around 100 million. And we expect the uh, rise in the number of uh, urban population in the coming years. This is usually mainly uh, due to the migration and also other related uh, activities. Uh, let's take you just quickly uh, through the, some of the existing assessment. And as I told you, much, much has been said by our minister, Her Excellency. So I, I'm, I'm not going to repeat. And we, we can just see some of the uh, cities and their uh, NMT environments. Let's see. Uh, yeah, this has been presented on, on the NURS presentation. So as you can see that uh, most of the transportation uh, service in, in the country or the travel pattern in the country, uh, especially on the capital city and also uh, these are the capital cities are Addis Ababa and also Bahardar and Redo are secondary cities, which are larger cities. And you can see the modal share for public transit and walking is much greater than the, the rest of the uh, transportations. Thanks. Yeah, this is also just to show you quickly, we can go on the on these pictures. There are good walkways on some secondary city, which could be a good example. And these are um, current efforts by the Addis Ababa Road Authority and the Addis Ababa City on the city center where they're improving the walkway with a nice pavement. And this is older towns in the northern part of Ethiopia where the cities, they are uh, having these uh, trees as a shade, a continuous trees and giving more emphasis for walking spaces so this is traditional towns <clears throat> even though that there are good things in in the country and also much of, more of the most of the secondary cities but there are still some problems as the previous presentations as we have seen in tanzania and other cities we're still also on some cities especially for those transit towns where the roads have been constructed by the regional I mean, by, by the national uh, road authorities, they uh, miss some of the walkway elements. And even though if they exist, they have been uh, encroached by the private vehicles, as you can see on this picture. Yeah, and the other issue, uh, which currently the city is trying to uh, elevate, especially in Addis, there have been much improvements. But in secondary cities, as you can see, night mobility is really hard because of the uh, there is no light in the road safety and also uh, related to personal security. There are several issues, especially for women and elderly people. Uh, yes, this is just to show you, even though there are some improvements on the walkway that has been done by the Addis Ababa Road Authority and the Traffic Management Agency and other uh, road authorities, uh, road and transport related uh, the offices in Addis, uh, but there are uh, much uh, management that needs to be done and this picture shows some of the private vehicles encroaching the public spaces or the walking spaces Next. <clears throat> yes this is a good example this is the same picture from the previous one where the there are vendors but still not encroaching uh, the clear walkway uh, zones for pedestrian movements Uh, there are some secondary cities actually which cycling share, the, the mode of the cycle share was uh, high compared to the some, some other cities. This is one, one city called Bahardar where the, there were a high number of bike riders but recently have been dropping because of the increase in the number of private uh, vehicles and also the tuk-tuks or the bajaj. And uh, you can see students are sharing the roads and at some point, if we don't provide a dedicated lane, then they will leave also this uh, mode of transport and we'll try to go to the different modes. So just to show that. 
Yes, and this is also a good illustration that shows that most uh, uh, disabled people, they use the uh, non-motorized transportation and uh, providing this uh, NMT zone or clear uh, cycling or walkway zones, uh, sufficient zones will also help the uh, disabled uh, people. Uh, so before the preparation of the NMT strategy, there were even some attempts actually by the city administration to provide cycle lanes in the city. So these were some of the cycle lanes that has been done uh, previously by the city administration, but due to some design issues and also the proper management coupled with different operation issues, so these corridors have not been uh, uh, utilized or have, been, have not been used so far as they were intended before. This is some, 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 some year back ago, around 2014 and 15, the city was trying to provide a dedicated lane, a cycle lane, but as you can see, they were not completely uh, de dedicated. As you can see, so they use markings instead of uh, providing a protection for the cycle lane. So this is a good uh, thing that we need, that we need to consider for to have a better cycle lanes in the future. The cycling culture is also there in different regions, on the, especially on the northern part of Ethiopia, where you can see this cycle rental is very common, especially for tourists and uh, uh, people who are living on, that, on, on those cities. This is one of those places. And the other, uh, just uh, I, as I mentioned on the pre, in the first slides, one of the components of this NMT strategy is to promote an active uh streets where they, there will be a pedestrian uh, where will be the streets and also the building will have a good interaction and this is an old town a traditional town in northern part axum the gray region where they people uh, used to design their houses with a proper arcade providing additional space for walking so just to show you those spaces so to summarize all these issues, so what we, we classify them under the in, uh, three different uh, major uh, issues. One is the infrastructure related issues and the other being the street management and the third one being the, the having cycle on, the, on your city, cycle culture. So the infrastructure and design issue was kind of inadequate footpath coverage as you can see on some of the pictures and unsafe pedestrian crossings on most of the intersections in the city and there were no dedicated cycle facilities on most all, all parts of the cities. And the street management, we lack parking management and the street vendors, even though there were good examples in some regions, but in Addis and also some other big cities, the vendors is a, a huge uh, challenge also where they utilize most of the walkways in the city. And that's uh, related to the cycle culture issue, still the socioeconomic stigma and also where especially for a female, the acceptance of riding bikes is also still needs to be done a lot on that. And what does this NMT strategy stands for? Uh, what, what, what is the content of this NMT? This has been already said by Her Excellency, but just to, uh, uh, to go through some, some of the major goals is to increase the modal share of the walking and uh, cycling and public transport or the, or the active modes, and also to reduce the personal motor vehicles, which uh, also uh, uh, another goal and also to improve road safety, which is one, Ethiopia is very, uh, <clears throat> it's well known around the world that most of the accidents uh, compared to the other African regions also, Ethiopia has the highest level of road fatalities and road accidents. So that could be also a solution uh, for to improve this road safety and also improved air quality. This has been also discussed before on different presentations. So we, we try to, uh, to do this and in order to measure those, we have a measurable target that we, we did that will align with the national and also international goals. Uh, and the strategy doesn't uh, talk about only the existing assessment and just go to the proposals to have such, such certain kilometers of cycle lanes or uh, the roadways or intersections, but it also tries to show how we should be designing our pedestrian networks. And as you can see, you need to have a clear different zones and uh, pedestrians needs to use a clear zone and the frontage could be used for vendors and uh, other, uh, which will also contribute to the economy of the city or the country at, uh, in large. And also they need to be also a furniture zone that will protect or that will give sheds to the pedestrians. 
And the other one, uh, which is also currently have been practiced uh, in Addis Ababa's road uh, designs, is incorporating cycle facilities. This was also been recommended under the strategy, and much has been improved, especially on the in Addis Ababa city, where we need to have a certain space dedicated from the road portion to the dedicated cycle lanes. Uh, intersection wise so the, this is also some of uh, the there has been so many uh, intersection improvements in Addis Ababa that has been done by the Addis Ababa traffic management agency in collaboration with the road authority and they were uh, using different analysis to find uh, the areas where there used to be a high uh, traffic accident uh, spots and they identified those and they were putting several interventions to do a permanent solution to those uh, areas by tightening the curves and also reducing the <coughs> crossing distance and the refugee islands where the where uh, currently there has been much improvements on those intersections regarding the road safety. Uh, the other issue is the bike sharing system. This is also under the Addis Ababa Transport Bureau, which is they are doing a feasibility study to implement an IT-based bike sharing system in, in the capital city. And this will also uh, is expected to improve the last mile access to uh, public transports that the city is doing, uh, implementing. So saying all those things, but uh, when we come to at a national level, it's not only Addis Ababa actually that has been addressed on this NMT strategy, but uh, the, those secondary cities, we uh, actually we, the, 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 the strategy has proposed that there needs to be uh, prioritization in the city's investments regarding the, the the payment or the money that we are spending for our transportation facilities, and uh, also we need to guide and prepare a set of a minimum and a guiding to work a uh, with the consultants and uh, the cities need to do also a, a sustainable uh, urban mobility studies especially those cities with a population of 300,000 uh, 300, and more residents the other one saying all those uh, uh, problems most of the especially those related with the street design and also the building design could be solved by improving our existing street design manuals and also our buildings uh, design manuals so uh, currently the ministry as her excellency was mentioning is trying to uh, improve the uh, design standards and they are working on the harmonized uh, urban street design manuals which will improve the speed the footpaths and cycling down and the pedestrian crossing and intersections Given, uh, will be given a, a major uh, attention. And regarding the building uh, control regulations, and uh, this has to be done also in the future to improve the, uh, the walkabilities. Uh, this is also uh, quite, well, I guess most of you are familiar with this car free list has been happening for a, a year, uh, more than a year. And this is one of the activities that the city and also at a, at a national level is doing to promote uh, and also to communicate with the citizens and uh, forward or outreach the information that they uh, requires regarding the NMT. So we can skip this view. This. Next. So, the, yeah, we can go, yeah, back, back. Okay. So <clears throat> after, after the preparation of the NMT strategy, uh, we can go next, sorry. After the preparation of the NMT strategy, as Her Excellency or our minister was mentioning, there, there has been an M NMT implementation plan that has been uh, prepared, and it includes uh, some proposals with 18 uh, major goals. This one of being uh, preparing the sustainable urban mobility with the timeline and also with the agencies dedicated for this. And at some point, adding also partners who should be supporting or who could support uh, to this uh, implementation uh, of this uh, strategy or mobility plans or any other developments that the, the, the country is trying to do. And these different actions has been set for 69 cities with how many kilometers of walkways they need to improve, which was already mentioned uh, on, the, on the opening speech. And also the cycle lane and other activities that they need to do. And uh, uh, coordinator or the as you can see on the uh, second on the right second part 
there will be a dedicated office that will be uh, requested to to respond to what uh, if some of these activities has been done or not so this is uh, one of the good thing that has been done by the at a national level so also formation of the steering committee is also one of the bigger uh, achievements where uh, you, as you can see different ministries and also their uh, officials will be representing and also discussing on the progress of the implementation of the NMT and what needs to be done on the future. Uh, so uh, Bahardar city, one of the secondary cities where we used to have this much more, most of the uh, dwellers used to ride by bikes. So the city is now starting to, to prepare this uh, uh, urban and uh, sustainable urban mobility plan. And that will uh, include uh, to assess the existing transport condition and the land use and other related policies. And the, the SAMP planning will, con uh, will uh, it consists of the NMT facilities, uh, including uh, cycling and also uh, school zones, so retrofitting the intersection, greenways, and all these uh, uh, elements that are listed here. And this one will make it different because it will have also implementing uh, phasings with individual projects being identified and sent to the city administration so that they could uh, prioritize uh, while implementing. The other one is for the harmonized street design manual, it's already said. Uh, so one of the achievements regarding the cycle lane, which I was mentioning, as you can see, these are some of the corridors that are uh, being under design or under, uh, has been already constructed and it includes a uh, cycle lane. And these are uh, in total around 41 kilometers of cycle lane are uh, designed and also planned. Um, and also some of them have been already constructed. Yeah, this is one of them being from uh, Jamo to Labu. This is, uh, or, uh, this is also the, the first cycle, uh, pilot cycle corridor that was uh, constructed by Addis Ababa Transport Bureau and a Traffic Management Agency in collaboration with partners. Another uh, new ongoing project as one of those pictures, uh, one of those uh, maps showing you, this is a new uh, ongoing road construction projects on the outskirts of Addis, where they're uh, having the dedicated cycle lanes uh, along the corridor. It's still under construction. Uh, regarding the bike sharing, so the city are, has already prepared the bike sharing feasibility study. And for the first phase, they also identified the station locations uh, by classifying them into three different groups, smaller, medium, and larger uh, bike sharing stations. And we, they are expecting to have at least 500 bike cycles to operate on the first phase. And uh, together with the uh, ITDP and UN Habitat, the city is also developing uh, the websites uh, so that people could recommend the location of the stations and also the location of uh, the uh, appropriate corridors for a bike uh, sharing so that will be also launched uh, once it's uh, finished and the other intersection improvement just uh, these are some of the intersections yeah these are some of the uh, list of intersections that has been done by the traffic management agency and uh, at the Sabah Road Authority and as you can see in the pictures this is one of the major uh, intersection uh, in the city where there are uh, several uh, pedestrians and also the there is a collision between the, the vehicular traffic and the uh, uh, pedestrians. So the city now has, uh, initially they did a, a temporary uh, intersection improvements and now they have done uh, permanent uh, uh, intersection improvements and the pedestrians have a lot of spaces to walk around and uh, the crossing distance are really uh, narrow and I, uh, I'm, I'm sure that the road safety issue has been also solved. And this is just to show you the last slide on the monthly car free days. This is not only in Addis, but this uh, started in Addis uh, a year ago, but it continues at a national level. And uh, I guess now most, most of the secondary cities in Ethiopia, they're celebrating, on, they're, um, yeah, they're uh, having these car free days at the end of each Ethiopian month uh, on Sundays. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Gasho.
Thanks, Kasho, for your presentation on the NMT strategy and the bike share system. Uh, what I picked from your presentation is that um, we need to encourage uh, network level design in order to support uh, investment. But also it's good that when we do the plans uh, that we're able to lay out clearly an implementation plan. So I think that helps governments and city authorities on quantifying what investment uh, is required um, is required for investment in walking and cycling infrastructure. Um, yeah, so that sets out uh, very clear outcomes, I think, uh, for investing in walking and cycling. And next, I think we'll have Penina, uh, who will present on the Kisumu Sustainable Mobility Plan. Penina is um, a transport planning associate uh, in Nairobi with ITDP Africa. Hi, Penina, you're welcome. Hi, um, thank you so much, Claire. Can you see my screen? Yes. Hi, Claire. Can. Okay, fine. Thank you. So I'll quickly take you through um, uh, the mobility, sustainable, Kisumu Sustainable Mobility Plan. And uh, because of time, I really rushed through the presentation. In case you'll have more questions, uh, I'll share my email address for more. So <clears throat> just to start us off, uh, sorry. Yeah, we need to first of all think about where we are as a country. I'll, this time I'm just talking about Kenya as far as road safety is concerned. And from based on the NTSA data, which is the authority uh, uh, given the power by the government to ensure that road safety is uh, paramount, uh, shared this data that in 2020, we had approximately 3,975 deaths uh, through road accidents. And this actually was an increase, an increase uh, by 10.8% compared to 2019. If we look again at the number distribution in terms of the people involved in the accidents, pedestrians were actually the, among the highest. Uh, it was actually the, among the highest with 1,383 1, people. Then again, cyclists, though it could be a small number, still a very important, num um, a significant number. Again, if you look at the air pollution, uh, again, of course, attributed by the road congestion and high priority in terms of infrastructure investment, focusing on cars, then we see a lot of um, air pollution, uh, premature deaths attributed by air pollution. Of course, this could also come from industrial, but we cannot uh, ignore the contribution by uh, traffic. And now going to Kisumu. Uh, Kisumu is actually one of the three cities in Kenya and uh, we see, we've started working there in 2016. Uh, we have been helping them come up with the Kisumu Sustainable Mobility Plan, which uh, we launched. And just looking at how people travel in Kisumu, which is very similar to other cities in Kenya, is that majority, which is 53% of people walk. And Something interesting about Kisumu is that cycling is actually part of public transport. We have 1% um, people who use cycle boda bodas, that's for daily commute. And then of course we have the people who own the bicycles themselves. So we have some significant number of people cycling and walking. But then in terms of infrastructure investment, you can see it doesn't match up. We have very good carriages, but very limited infrastructure for walking and cycling. Um, this is how uh, it, the city used to look like, at least it's going to, it's improving and I'll be sharing some of those photos. And um, we had some very major wide streets that are very unsafe for children crossing the road and this actually increased their risk of accident. And um, going back to how some of the communities are making interventions, Communities just used to, you know, do their, you know, do their do yourself uh, sort of bumps to just calm the traffic, and it's kind of works. But this just shows that the community understands and put safety as a key priority. Because if your child is going to die while going to school, why would you let them walk anyway? So it's it's very important to ensure that you have safety on our roads. And then go looking at cycling. Um, Similarly, we still do not have a very good infrastructure, despite the fact that we also have, like I mentioned, Boda Boda uh, 
or rather uh, psycho Buddha, Buddha's operating in the, in the city. And uh, so again, cyclists are pushed onto the road, mixing with the uh, private cars and uh, matatus and all that. So in the process, we have a lot of accidents involving the cyclists. So Kisumu now decided to change the status quo and uh, we, we and, um, the goal or the mission for this um, Kisumu Sustainable Mobility Plan is to provide efficient, affordable, equitable, safe and convenient mobility for all. This way, we, safety is paramount because we know we don't lose anybody. One life is very much important because in fact, even most of the accidents that happen, it, they happen around uh, people of their prime age, between 15 to 45. Those are people who are working, school going children. So we need to ensure that uh, we ensure that at least Whatever it is that we are promoting in this mobility plan, safety was paramount. Equitability meant that everyone is catered for and that's not compromising the NMT users. So the Kisumu Sustainable Mobility Plan was launched uh, earlier this year uh, by the His Excellency the Governor. Now it's already adopted implementation and uh, we're happy to say that already implementation is happening. So some of the proposals in the Kisumu um, Sustainable Mobility Plan is to ensure that we have quality uh, working facilities. We propose to have at least 100 kilometers of footpaths across the city, as you can see in the map, ensure that we have safety school zones that children are able to get to school safely, and also ensure that even the uh, major highways that are owned by maybe the national uh, government, like Ken House, are able to retrofit NMT or working for infrastructure in their improvement. So this is one of the streets, uh, like Noor mentioned in her presentation, we already have a um, Sumu Trango project, which has been ongoing and, um, yeah, at least safety and walking in Kisumu is actually becoming very nice and lively. And uh, another important aspect in with the proposal, and we are still working with the city to improve on, is the crossings. So we have uh, several of these uh, pedestrian crossings across the city. We call them the tabletop crossings. They're elevated. They're universally accessible. The pedestrians are elevated. They also act as a traffic calming aspect. So that improves a lot of safety in the streets. And these are just the school zones, like I mentioned, uh, that we propose to have um, safety uh, enhanced to ensure that our school going children are able to get there safely. And maybe just to talk about something that is very important in making the business case for working and cycling, there must be interaction between the NMT infrastructure and the building, specifically the working, because more people on foot means more people for business. But then we have to ensure that the, the buildings themselves are able to connect with the pedestrians walking. So this is not Kisumu, this is Westlands in Nairobi. And uh, these people decided to just put some metal bars, so to speak, sort of a fence in front of the building. You know, at the moment you put this, then you, you there's no connectivity, there's no integer connection. It's hard to see, to interact with the building. And so pedestrians will end up using the, you know, the other side of the, the carriageway and there's no uh, safety and all that. So again, we have to do it with massive compound walls because the more compound walls we have, then again, there's no integer connectivity. So it becomes really insecure for you to walk around uh, these such, such areas. And because nobody is watching over you because pedestrian safety and security is paramount. And then again, like I said, if you don't allow people to interact with the building, then people, people cannot be able to see the businesses that are inside. Another important aspect to do away with when you're designing uh, our NMT and connecting with the buildings is that you have to also avoid a lot of parking high uh, level, you know, like we see this a lot in Nairobi, where you'll see like the first floors are occupied by parking. Again, now you're putting the people who are in the buildings higher above them, the pedestrians. So again, uh, it doesn't make a very good case even for the businesses because the, the people will be getting inside to you know purchase something are fewer. At the same time, it doesn't make it attractive to work in such a neighborhood because safety and security again uh, is hard. Because if you're being marked up walking along here, before the, these people see or come down to help you you're on your own, you know? So those are just some of the things. So we need to ensure that we have visually active frontages that you have overlooking windows, uh, that people can be able to walk around, see what's happening inside the building. And most importantly, we have to have physically permeable frontages. We have to have multiple doors and accesses so that, uh, that are, one is able to connect with the businesses. This is how you maximize uh, profitability for the businesses along the energy corridors. 
And for Kisim, what we've been doing, of some of the streets are really good in that. We have very active frontages. But then what we're also doing is harmonizing with the Kisumu physical and land use plan to ensure that at least along the CBD or along the major public transport routes, we have uh, visually active frontages to ensure that there's that connection and so that people, we can leverage on the pedestrians working to improve the businesses along the streets. And again, this is the second network uh, in the Kisumu Sustainable Mobility Plan. Uh, we hope that this is going to be implemented. And again, NMT infrastructure doesn't have to be expensive. Simple retrofits can be able to work. And like this was just a temporary thing, but it was removed. This does not exist at the moment, but you can see with simple flower pots, you can be able to, set, to provide a safe and secure second network along across the city without necessarily building an extra one. And uh, finally, something just to talk about the value of, there have been a lot of discussion from Nairobi and uh, by the ministers uh, about the issue of parking. This is Nairobi and what happened, uh, this is um, one of uh, Mamangina street. And so what happened at this time, this, all these parks used to be parking and they reclaimed all this space and provided, uh, you know, expanded the pedestrian realm. And right now, this is actually one of the most expensive place to rent uh, commercial space in Nairobi CBD. Expanding, you know, just to show the value of providing uh, NMT infrastructure, is just not good for health and climate change and air quality and reduction of accident, but it can also improve um, aspect of um, you know, of the businesses, like the people who own the property values on that side. And also now for the cities, because again, uh, parking is also an issue I like to talk about. We have to balance between parking, uh, it generating the revenue and it being a source or it actually being a source of investment for NMT infrastructure. So cities need to invest in proper parking management system and Kisumu is actually uh, in a process. Uh, we'll be starting that project soon, just of helping them come up with a parking policy so that now they're able to manage how they use their private cars. And now actually ensuring that some of that uh, revenue that is generated from parking, it is just invested back to NMT infrastructure. So that's the end of my presentation and uh, feel free to reach out in case of anything. I hope I took a little time. Thank you, Claire. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Penina. Uh, that was uh, a really insightful uh, presentation. Uh, I think it's very interesting. I think the parking issue is now coming out in the light on how we need to manage parking. But in our case for investing in NMT, we need to probably have proper parking management uh, such that this can actually be a source of funds for investing uh, in NMT, maintaining NMT facilities in my city here in Kampala, you see the, the, the road funds are allocated to maintaining only carriageways, but there's no funding for, you know, side uh, streets for walking and cycling uh, infrastructure. And it's also good to, that you touched on how we should design uh, the NMT facilities so that there is that interaction between uh, businesses and people walking. That's encouraging for people to, to walk, but then it also creates a business sense in terms of uh, lively streets people are able to connect. I think we've had several cases where uh, streets have been made uh, NMT only and businesses have improved, uh, they've improved uh, the design of the streets, uh, we've improved street lighting, We've also seen uh, similar cases uh, in Tanzania where they have made uh, corridors, uh, public transport and NMT only, and we can see an improvement uh, in, in road safety. Of course, if you have uh, public transport moving at low speed and a lot of pedestrians in the urban areas and CBDs, I think those make strong cases uh, for walking and cycling. Uh, I'll just touch on the comments um, that are here. I think this one is for Penina. Uh, thanks so much for the great presentation, Penina, sharing these value perspectives from Kenya. Great to see that the plan, great to see the plan developments. Can you kindly advise how funds were mobilized for the NMT improvements, such as cycleways? Uh, thank you so much for that question. So what happened in Kisumo? You know, the moment you have a plan, then investors will definitely come up. 
And what happened uh, with this mobility plan, we've seen a lot of investment by development partners, inclu including Kenya Urban Support Program, who have funded the uh, Kisumu Trago project, for example. We've also seen the city also in investing significant amount of revenue into the in NMT infrastructure. So the moment you just have a plan, then money is going to come. So I would advise cities to work on the plans first, and then money is going to come. Because the, then the plan is able to guide the, uh, the investors where they're going to put the money. And as long as I think this webinar is very important because now they can justify why actually investing in NMT is important for the businesses, for the air quality, for the road safety and reduction of accidents. And just making that as a case, uh, I think uh, cities can be able to, to get money for that. Yeah. Yes, opinion. I think I think that's a strong case. I think we have seen uh, some cities where uh, budgets are allocated, and at the end of the financial year, the funds are going back because there is nothing ready. So I think it's better we prepare now, quantify what needs to be done and how much it's going to cost with proper designing, of course, and at network level, and then. Um, I think then if they find the plans are ready and the, the case is made, then I think making the investment will be a bit uh, easier to make. Sure. Um, I don't know if there is another question. Um, yes, that was from Caroline uh, Baba. She says thank you and good luck. Um, if anyone has any other question, uh, please uh, feel free to share your questions uh, for interaction uh, in this uh, chat box. Thanks, Penina. Thanks, Penina, for the presentation. Okay, so if we don't have uh, any more questions, or if maybe one or two people would like to make specific comments on the topic, uh, please you can raise your hand and you can share maybe one or two people, perhaps. Uh, there is another question for you, uh, Penina. What are the exact school zone improvements you're talking about in Kisumu? So, first of all, around schools, we have to know that we have high number of young people crossing the road. So, what we have to ensure is that we have to ensure that the speed limits are very low. We would recommend a, a maximum of 30 kilometers per hour. Then we ensure that they have adequate traffic calming aspects. So we have uh, um, bumps, speed bumps, speed limits, indicating that the drivers need to slow down. And most importantly, ensure that we have um, safe pedestrian crossings. I've just shared that example of raised tabletop crossings. That, I love it because it's elevated. And then like, so children are more, you know, they are raised at a higher level so the drivers can be able to see them, you know. And also um, another aspect, uh, because they are you know, it's like a fat bump, kilometers that word fat bump. So the vehicles themselves have to slow down when they are, you know, before they, when they are crossing over that, that tabletop crossing. So those are some of the aspects. But of course, you have to do a lot of campaigns uh, around safe school zones and, uh, you know, promoting car free days just to ensure that people know the number of people who actually die out of accidents. And, you know, just ensuring that uh, training is done even for the students on how to cross the road and um, even the teachers being supportive of that. I've also seen even another organization that actually promote backpacks, school backpacks that are reflective so that even if it's dark in the evening or in early mornings, you can be able to see a child uh, maybe crossing or using the street. So those are some of the initiatives that uh, the Kisumu Sustainable Mobility Plan takes, but mostly our initiatives are the infrastructural aspect, the speed limits, the traffic calming aspect, the um, yeah, just that. Those are the main ones. Okay, um, thanks, Selena. There is uh, another question about uh, school children engaging in cycling as part of their travel to school, mm -hmm. or how are they safe as cyclists on NMT infrastructure? 
So actually, Kisumu is very interesting. I remember sometime back going around the, you know, the city and some of the schools that you would find a lot of, you know, bikes within the schools. Uh, but unfortunately, we do not have a lot of uh, connectivity, connected and continuous cycling infrastructure in the city. Of course, that exposes them to the risk of accidents. And that's why we are recommending today to ensure that we provide uh, safe cycling infrastructure that connect across the city. Because we may provide in one specific street, but then those children come from different parts of the city and uh, maybe decide that maybe they do not have infrastructure. That's even where we're having a lot of uh, students coming uh, from. So we need to ensure that um, cycling infrastructure is provided across, um, you know, across the city. And then another important aspect is we have to also train children on road, use, road safety again, like I mentioned before, and even ensure that even the bicycle, the cycle designs <clears throat> are gender sensitive, you know, that because you've seen a lot of girls not even cycling because of how most of the bike bicycles are designed. So to even encourage that, we need to see uh, a proper design. I think Kampala has a very good example. I think Claire has shared that where, you know, the design is comfortable even for a girl cycling to school in a dress, you know, to make it comfortable for people to cycle. Because even from our data uh, in Kisumu, we realize that we have a very small number of women cycling compared to even the men and even the children. So just ensuring that even the, the, the type of bicycles that we make out here are gender sensitive. And of course, even provision of um, cycle parking, even in schools, because you will see in schools, uh, children are going to tie their bicycles on the trees, you know? So we need to ensure that we provide a uh, safe cycle parking for, for that. Yeah. Okay, um, thanks, uh, Penina. I think uh, in the interest of time, I think we shall go to the next session. Uh, in the next session, uh, we're going to have uh, a panel uh, we want to have a discussion now that we've had uh, on the different case studies. Uh, Noor, uh, in the first presentation, presented about uh, what are the arguments or what, what's compelling for investing uh, in walking and cycling. Uh, she made uh, the statistics on what would be if we did not invest, what is there at risk, and what are the benefits if we did uh, invest uh, in walking and cycling. And we wouldn't want this to just uh, stop at this, but we want to have to build collective action. How do we in East Africa uh, build uh, this collective action on how we are going to continue to support the investment in walking and cycling? So on this panel, I'm going to have uh, Judy uh, Bala. Uh, she's the Kisumu city planner. And then we're going to have our uh, Neji Labi from the African Development Bank and Liz Brill. Sorry, I'm not sure I, did, I said that correctly, but as uh, the head of mobility and transport at AFD. So I'll invite uh, Judy, uh, Judy to tell us what are some of the approaches uh, that we can consider to build this collective effort to support uh, investment, this investment in working and cycling. Yeah, I'm not sure if we still have Judy on the call. Okay, um, maybe we can um, start um, with uh, the African Development Bank, Neji. Yes, Claire. Yes, uh, good to have you on the call, uh, Neji. Um, yes. Please uh, give us your insights and uh, possible approaches on how we can uh, build this collective uh, action. What can we okay. do as an East okay. African region or as Africa? As African, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Claire and uh, all the team. I thank you for this uh, very, very uh, interesting uh, presentation and uh, the real problem is walking and cycling. I, I uh, probably tell, <laughs> uh, I don't have a need to tell you that the problem is real in our cities. 
and especially walking and cycling. Uh, we are not yet there yet at this stage, and uh, probably the walking and the crossing uh, in our big cities and capitals is very, very uh, dangerous. And uh, <clears throat> no respect, I think, from uh, motorized uh, users to others, uh, to other modes, especially walking and uh, vulnerable modes, uh, and especially uh, women and uh, females, we have a, a big problem. In, uh, in, the, in the African Development Bank, uh, recently and uh, since two years maybe, we have a, an urban division and we are wor working hard to uh, put all urban aspects in our projects in especially in roads, trans, uh, roads and transport projects. As you know, the, the real challenge for the bank since many years is to, uh, to make this, uh, to make infrastructure disposal to our countries uh, without uh, thinking about the different aspects. But right now we have a lot of problems in our cities and we, uh, we are facing uh, these different problems, especially Working. I think the city is done for people, and people are uh, human, and the human are moving first by working before getting to these uh, uh, motorized modes, uh, buses, cars, etc. And uh, the, 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 the mentality in Africa is still uh, getting the car is uh, to get some uh, social uh, days, etc. But I think uh, we have to uh, deal first with governments. Governments, they don't think about, uh, when they come to the African Development Bank for their projects, uh, the, 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 first, uh, the first, I think, input is to get the infrastructure. They have problems to finance infrastructure. And uh, when we, uh, the, the first discussion is how to finance this, how to, et cetera. We don't think about all the different and urban aspects. Right now, the bank is, focusing and implementing the new strategy of urban development strategy and is imposing to all different projects in roads and especially in urban area, uh, urban areas in general, to focus on the urban aspects. First at all is how to be safe for different modes and especially non-motorized uh, modes. Uh, second is the urban aspects in uh, the terms of getting the infrastructure in its urban context and uh, uh, including this and implementing the infrastructure to serve the urban uh, users, the urban city, and to be uh, more uh, reliable and more, uh, uh, let's say, the service is for urban and not the first service is to make people uh, moving from point to point in special speeds, etc. Uh, now we have uh, our urban division, and we uh, are implied on all the projects in, uh, in Africa, transport projects and other projects also. And uh, the bank is imposing the, these different uh, aspects of non-motorized. And uh, we are going to probably to, uh, to finance uh, strategic studies for non-motorized uh, uh, modes in urban uh, areas and cities in Africa. Uh, and we are doing, uh, uh, let's say, uh, we are starting this job with different cities and uh, different governments to uh, make them uh, informed about what the bank is doing and how to uh, benefit from uh, our different finance the funds uh, to finance uh, small studies in uh, non-motorized in cities and uh, uh, traffic uh, management and uh, different aspects related to this uh, safety of uh, wor working and uh, cycling. Uh, the different, uh, let's say different items are in our, uh, we have the new urban mobile, uh, Urban and Municipal Development Fund, which is uh, now working from uh, last year, and cities can, can uh, benefit from this fund to help them uh, with the small grants to, uh, let's say, study and uh, design or to assist them to uh, diagnose, uh, diagnose uh, anything in the city 
special uh, transport and uh, no motorized and uh, etc. So uh, I invite uh, our friends from this uh, workshop. If they have uh, any question, they can send us. I will, we will uh, return to them the Urban Mobility Fund uh, presentation. And uh, they can also, uh, through uh, ITDP, Chris or Claire, send us their uh, requests to uh, know more about uh, the bank and its uh, programs for the uh, cities and for the non-motorized, uh, let's say, uh, non-motorized modes in our cities and our strategy, which is uh, under preparation, etc. Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Raji. Sorry, you can hear me clearly. Uh, okay, sorry. Yes, thanks so much, uh, Neji, uh, for that. It's, uh, I think, awesome to hear that uh, the bank is prioritizing NMT and also prioritizing funding uh, studies uh, in preparation for, for the NMT uh, implementations in different cities uh, in Africa. Um, then I think, I think maybe I had a, a follow-up question on would the bank, um, I don't know, how many, do you do the studies? Uh, do you fund or are these priorities done in a specific region or is this uh, only within the East African region? Uh, not in a specific, as you know, the bank is working on all African countries. So it's not okay. in a specific region or country, but it concerns all countries, all regions, and all, uh, all the cities in Africa. Uh, what we do now, right now, uh, we have uh, two, uh, we have the projects. We have the projects, big projects in roads and uh, in big cities like Accra or in, uh, uh, Abuja or Lagos or any uh, uh, Kenya or... Uh, <clears throat> on these projects, before we, we, we don't take any care about this uh, type of modes, okay? we. Uh, the project is a road, is an interchange with all components, and uh, we don't care about the other modes and the, uh, the surrounding area of the project. The, the bank now has his strategy. If you have any project in this kind, in this kind of projects in any city or any country, you need to have the urban part, and the urban part comprises different aspects of ur urbanism and transportation. Uh, urban transportation, urban traffic, urban congestion, uh, urban modes, how to deal with all modes and all modes must be included and gender and etc. So uh, this type of project right now is uh, we have to do it in all projects. So uh, if we have to, uh, to put money to, uh, to make cycling or to make walking sites, etc, we have to do it. It's an obligation. Oh. On the other side, oh. we have, yes, in the urban, uh, urban and municipal development fund, we have what we call the small grant initiative. This small grant initiative is rapidly, and we can help and assist cities if they need to, for example, know what the problems in their cities, big cities or small cities, about the non-motorized, about the congestion, about the traffic. They can get this rapidly, and we can assist them to help and help them to get this uh, figure and understand what is the real problems and what is the recommendation for the future. If the recommendation is to make a big study, they can, it's a big study. We can help them and prepare the TORs and probably look to find this uh, study. If it's a big project we define with all the aspects and the components, the bank can also help and fund and uh, search for funds or for cooperation with other uh, multilateral uh, donors. Is this clear? Oh, okay. Thanks, Nate. Yes, yes, that's clear. And also in support of that, I see uh, Babati also from the bank um, has said uh, in, the, in the chat box that uh, the bank has set up like a new fund uh, to support uh, project uh, preparations <laughs> Uh, that's that. like NMT projects. So that is very interesting to see. 
So I, I, I was just wondering if there is, um, with these funds in place, is there a way we can build like a corporation? I know this is project preparation, so we can mm -hmm. have like, a corporation of, I, I don't know if it can be the, the, the funding agencies and all other stakeholders on how do we move this uh, also from the preparation to the investment uh, part of it. So there's already good indicators in that support for investing and setting up a fund, I think is a good mm -hmm. step uh, towards that. So what do you think about um, building that cooperation with maybe other development agencies or other stakeholders uh, so that collectively we can uh, support uh, all other urban uh, infrastructure such as NMT. Yes, Claire, it, uh, it's open to all possibilities. Okay, that's, that's great uh, to hear. Good. Okay. Um, I think uh, we thank so much, uh, Neji, uh, for your contribution, and uh, you've basically given us uh, what do I call it? Thank you very much. You've given us you've given us the support or <laughs> the affirmation that the the cooperation is possible, and there is already yeah. small steps in the direction of forming a cooperation of some sort in the supporting investment direction. Yes, yes, no problem. We can, we can discuss later and uh, check, uh, uh, let's case by case, there's no problem. Okay, thank you so, so much. Um, for that. Yeah, I think we can uh, hear from um, our next uh, panelists, uh, Lise from the, Afri from the French Development Bank. Lise, you're welcome. Hello, thanks for inviting me. You hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. First, thanks a lot for IGDP for inviting me. I would like um, to say maybe maybe two things on uh, to address your your question about these approaches that we can develop as development bank to build collective actions for non-motorized transport. First, um, just let me say that as development bank. I mean, we're all convinced here, that's good. <laughs> so we have included non-motorized transport in our strategy for quite a long time, recognizing all the impacts that have been developed throughout the workshop on accessibility, proper climate, air quality, road safety, et cetera. Um, but there are two but. <laughs> First one is that um, it's usually not the request of our clients, which are local authorities and governments, they come to us because we provide mainly loans. They come to us for big projects and they don't want to borrow for a bunch of small things that are usually in the hand of a local authority to make it a bit direct. So there's, um, I think all this work that you're providing on giving tools to convince, not us, we are convinced, but um, decision makers uh, from um, uh, all the governments, African government, I think is very important. So second but is that there is a sort of gap for non-motorized. It is too small for a loan. It is too big for a subsidy. Um, I mean, we have subsidies to plan for non-motorized to, for sometimes for pilot project. But if you want to do something, you need more than 1 million. Um, and then we don't have subsidies anymore in the transport sector, as, at least for AFD, subsidies are directed a lot to social sectors for projects. So transport is not considered as priority for it. And then it comes to a loan, and then it comes back to my first bat, which is people don't want to bury. So that's the first, um, maybe, um, the context as I see it. But nevertheless, I see four, uh, four ways, four approaches for us to support such, such action. First one, and you mentioned it before, is planning, is including that in, in the planning of transport. 10 years ago, when you said, I'm going to plan transport in a city, you ended up with mass transit um, plan, uh, costing billions and basically unfeasible. 
now um, and in particular with uh, the partnership Mobilize Your City that we have uh, launched uh, five years ago, we are trying to promote the same actions that you've been doing in Kusumu, by the way, which is planning sustainable mobility, including all components of mobility, not only mass transit, but non-motorized, but um, urbs, et cetera, and et cetera. So first is, is uh, planning, um, including in a realistic way, efficient and realistic way. And very often we have come to the fact that there was a sort of first phase of quick wins where we could have all this um, investment in non-motorized with small money, high impact, and then uh, mobilizing. It's, it's, a, it's a long time. I mean, building a BRT or a tramway or a metro is a 10 years project. So in the meantime, do small um, investment with uh, quick impact. So, so they, they, they come under the quick win uh, option. Second way is through the basic project is just um, when we have a mass transit project, um, and I think now that is the case, case everywhere, we have this complete street approach whereby you not only uh, lay down some tracks or whatever, but you have a uh, facade a facade, we say in French or complete street, you work on the sidewalks, on the lighting, on the cycle lane, etc. So that's easy to raise funds, just as I mentioned, because people come to us for this. But, but it's not a global holistic approach. And sometimes in India, for instance, I have seen projects whereby you have good accessibility to the station for 500 meters, <laughs> uh, a radius of 500 meters, and then the cycling lanes stop. So they, it's a problem. <laughs> uh, but at least you start with something and it makes, uh, it's, it's like a starter. Third way is, to develop uh, city programs whereby um, you have a sort of different approach. It's not the big project, it's a bench of sidewalks, junctions, cycle lanes, small investment you put together um, through a holistic approach this time. And you have adapted procurement. Uh, that's the program that they call pay for results. You just give them money on a sort of um, starting, um, I mean, it's per kilometer, for instance. Uh, it's holistic, it can be a possibility, very interesting, but that's also, um, um, that's what I dream, I'm dreaming of. Uh, I'm dreaming of developing such projects uh, in African cities. But again, so far, it is not the request of our, of, of our clients. Sometimes we do that uh, putting multi-sectoral with our colleagues from the develop, urban development division. Uh, they have an approach like they did in Kisumu, by the way, uh, where they have um, uh, urban equipment, it can be a market, uh, it can be a station, some portion of roads, etc. So a bunch of infrastructure at the, at the level of the city. And the fourth way for us to approach it is um, through policy loans. Uh, and having a sort of dedicated access on non-motorized, whereby we support establishing a national strategy, just as Ethiopia has, has presented, uh, whereby we support um, adopting new standards for urban roads. We've been fine. I've seen project, it was in Cameroon, where we were supposed to rehabilitate an urban road and there was no sidewalk, just not planned. <laughs> so I think we have also sometimes engineers that, that needs to also um, be updated on how today we do traffic calming, et cetera, et cetera, for urban road. Traffic calming is not, was not, um, taught like 40 years ago. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> there's just really some capacity building on this. There is still very much on the speed uh, approach. So there's a number of measures that can be triggers for uh, policy loans. Um, and probably uh, we need to develop, I mean, the, these four approach, huh? the planning, the project, the city programs and the policy loans uh, in order to be efficient. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Lizzie. Uh, it, your first bats were really interesting. They don't ask for it. <laughs> yes, but yes, but and, I, and on I, the contrary, I, we have to fight for this. I mean, we are developing a project in Yaoundé where we have to fight uh, so that it's not only auto car centric. <laughs> they would ask only. Yes, but, yes uh, before I get into the chat and um, the questions that might be there. 
if they can if they can request for quick wins investments which are also a small amount why why can't they ask for the nmt infrastructure because i mean sometimes the quick wins can maybe quite a length of a network this is my second but um i would say is that um if it's under a loan there's a sort of minimum that before we process a loan <laughs> which is something around 10 million and and it is not always um i mean once it, it it's not always i mean i, I don't want to push people to to uh, to spend money <laughs> so it can be just low cost and, and that's fine and that's good but just they wouldn't come to us if someone is coming to me with a real program um, uh, I and, and the capacity to borrow and the capacity to have if it's a local authority to have the government borrowing for it because that's one of the points uh, implementing agency I are at the local are at the so we should convince national government have sovereign loans, sovereign loans and unlend them to the local authorities that's basically i'm sorry to enter into the kitchen of this but um i think that's one of the um, hindrance okay um yeah okay i think uh maybe if we when we get joined again by by one of uh government representatives, they can, uh, they can maybe try to answer for us why uh, some of the reasons uh, they don't ask for them. But on the positive note, uh, of course, you've made uh, some really good points, which are also aligning with the ones uh, that we've had from the African Development Bank. Uh, so we need an investment in planning. So there is the different uh, components that we need for the investment. We need the, the planning level, we need um, the, invest, the, the implementation level. So what, what we're trying to aim at that cooperation to make sure that uh, we invest, at least we have support from different levels. I, I don't know if you understand. Yeah, we have support from different levels and at least we know what uh, the issue is. Asking is an issue, so <laughs> that can easily be worked on. But it's good to know that the, the, the support and the effort is there at least. Uh, yes, yeah, the support bank. is this. And, and for just as uh, African Development Bank, I mean, I think all the donors are aligned on this now, if I see my discussion with all the colleagues. So I think amongst the community of donors, it's 100% it's aligned. Funds are available to study. Um, it is very well. Uh, welcomed that we include these components in any project, but it's always an exercise of prioritization that we don't do alone. I, I understand, I understand, but um, it, for me, and I think maybe some of the participants, it's exciting that the money is there, the support is there, so maybe the gap is from us, the, the, the governments and the countries and the cities uh, that need the facilities. So, Ministry of Finance, huh? I think it's important. It's not maybe really <laughs> true. Yeah, we've had several discussions where the Ministry of Finance uh, is being paid to. So, I, I think there is a need um, to have uh, the different players uh, in this kind of cooperation. Of course, the governments, the funders, the ministries of finance. And yeah, all those players uh, need to be included. But uh, what I'm getting right now is. Uh, what we are intending to get to, I think we are having the willingness uh, from the leaders who is uh, the development funds. And of course, we're doing more uh, in our presentation, we are presenting what uh, the benefits are, what is the business case for this. So we have to sensitize and talk about it uh, more and more. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you so uh, much. And you're doing a great job, by the way. I'm very fun. <laughs> all the ITDP on this, huh? Oh, thank you so much on behalf of ITDP. Mm? Yeah. Okay, thanks so much, Lisa. There might be questions for you, so if you could stay on the line. I haven't been able to get to all of them, but uh, maybe for now, uh, let me get, um, give me one second. I think uh, we are not being, uh, I think Judy may not be able to join in, uh, but I've been informed that engineer Keno 
the Chief Officer Transport for County of Mombasa, uh, is online and can share some thoughts on this approach that we're trying uh, to develop. So Engineer Keno, please, if you can join and give us some of your insights on how we can prioritize and build uh, the action in support of investing in NMT, and also maybe answer some of Lisa's questions. Is it true that governments <laughs> don't ask for that funding? Or is that funding too small? Uh, Keno, if you're online, uh, please, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, Thank you. In, uh, in Mombasa, I wanted to ask, there was a question on uh, when Nairobi was presenting about uh, enforcement on the encroachers to the NMT yes. facilities. What the experience in Mombasa was when we did the NMT on like uh, tarmac or uh, uh, paving blocks that are gray, cars parked on them, so they were not used for the intended purpose. But when we changed them to red, and the red uh, carpet uh, aspect came in the, in the sense that we were saying NMT being the biggest uh, mode of transport in Mombasa at 53%, we thought that it would be good to treat those people as VIPs. So the red carpet came from the VIP treatment aspect. Now that, uh, and after the public participation and uh, being told about the same, everybody accepted it. And now if anybody is found parking on a red carpet, uh, as the general public will take a photo and they post it on us. So that makes it easier for us to for purposes of enforcement. What that means is that all the citizens are enforcers and you are able to be caught. So that made it very easy so that everybody fears parking on that because you'll be caught and you'll be charged for the same. So that makes a bigger enforcement because it might be difficult to put enforcement officers everywhere, every time. So I wanted to bring that as a one way of ensuring that you can actually track people and force them off and leave the facility for the intended purpose. As far as uh, the, the, the infrastructure funding is concerned, it's, a, it's, it's quite a big challenge because infrastructure is very expensive and indeed we have short funds. The county government Bombasa does not have enough funds to do all the infrastructure for NMT because NMT is part of the road, and uh, generally the roads are given preference. That is the current thinking, although we are trying to change that kind of thinking to include the NMT, and hence we have a, a complete street design. Uh, so we have uh, consulted the national agencies that provide roads to also include NMT as part of their, of their infrastructure that so whatever they are doing they are trying to do the same but we would want to have uh not only us but i'm sure all the other cities increased funding but when from the allocation from the limited budgeting we it is interesting to see what the the french are talking about and the the african development bank so, so then we are also enlightened we were we were not asking for it because we didn't they, we didn't think there were avenues or openings for the same but from these kind of workshops, we are being enlightened with the same, and we would uh, want to probably engage and have uh, uh, support on the same. That would be my thinking for now. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, for your insight. Um, yeah, it, I think it's a good point that our citizens now become enforcers because I think in certain cities, the enforcers or the, the traffic police can no longer manage perhaps all the level of encroachment uh, on NMT facilities. And also there is, it's also interesting that you're saying, well, NMT, we've seen that some of the benefits uh, of NMT infrastructure is that it's cheap. And then uh, AFD says that uh, there will be funding uh, most of the funding is uh, small. So there is an opportunity. I think there is just a need uh, to align uh, both efforts and needs. And we'll be taking this discussion further in our next uh, workshop 
about uh, this specific topic later into this year, and we shall unfold more into how can we actually build uh, this strong support or this uh, roadmap and this collective action from the different players with their different interests uh, to support uh, NMT investment. Um, thank you uh, so much for all your contributions. I think I will, if you have any questions, let me check if there is any questions in the chat, just one minute. Okay, I think there is quite, uh, we are running out of time and there is quite uh, comments uh, from in the chat. I think uh, some, I think engineer Keno and the panelists, uh, you can try to answer some of the, of the queries and comments and questions in the chat uh, directly to, to the participants. And I think, thank you so much everyone for participating. I will quickly hand over to Curly from UNEP uh, to close uh, today's workshop. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Great, thanks. So, wow. Um, I mean, sometimes closing remarks feel, feels like you have the easiest job in the world, and then other days like today, it feels like the hardest. Um, firstly, and most importantly, I just want to say a huge thanks to you, Claire, and the rest of the ITDP Africa team um, who have, you've all been instrumental in pulling together the business case research and the organization of this workshop. So thank you very much because today wouldn't have been possible without you. Also a big thank you to all our keynote speakers and our panelists for all of your ideas and experiences and thoughts. So I cannot, I definitely cannot attempt to summarize the wealth and nuances of discussions today, but I would, I've been sitting here quite quietly just listening and absorbing and I'd love to make just some reflections to, to close out the session. So I think the first thing that really struck me is that there is no one size fits all. Every country, every city, every neighborhood, every rural area, every peri-urban area has different needs. And at the core of getting things right, and I think Amanda really demonstrated this today, is engaging with our citizens and our different stakeholder groups to really understand the context and the specific needs. And I think sometimes with all of the design guidelines and the toolkits and the policy recommendations, it's easy to forget that we can't have a blanket approach, but we have to the governments and the banks who are funding projects really have to be patient and understand the context. Um, I think the other thing that I keep thinking about is how much the global pandemic has shone a light really on how important a robust and integrated transport system is and what a difference mobility makes between kind of having continued and safe connectivity and isolation, depending on whether we're investing in all of the people or just a few. Um, I think my other point is that it's really clear to me that transport is not an infrastructure issue. It's an equity issue. And at the moment, we're just not investing enough in the majority of our users. And when we look at the majority of how people are moving, they are walking and they and more and more people would cycle. But we have to start being fair with how we spend our transport budgets. I think it's really clear that the future is active transport. I don't think there's any doubt in anyone's mind that the business case for walking and cycling investment has not been proven. I don't think we can say the same. I'm very biased, but I don't think we can say the same for any other mode of transport, that we have such a positive impact spanning all of the sectors, pollution, health, air quality, congestion, road safety, we can go on. And we've heard some really good examples as to how. And, you know, Major General Mohammed. Buddy said, despite progress, we have not done enough. And, you know, I think he really set it out. And I think we, we need leaders like that who can be honest and say, we're trying, but we need to do more. And the question is no longer, how can we do it? Because we know how. It's just how quickly can we deliver what we know needs to be done? And I think the government leaders and the development banks really have a key leadership role to play there. And like planting a tree, the best time was 50 years ago and the next best time is now. So, you know, there's definitely a role for everyone. And I think we all have to kind of work hand in hand because we're looking at big 
challenges. And on that note, I just want to remind everyone, I shared the link in the chat to join the Africa Network for Walking and Cycling. We've got a really good group of 50 organizations, globally Africa-based, but all, all working on these issues and coming up with solutions. So please do join so that we can kind of keep this discussion going and actually look at practical actions on what we can do as a collaborative group to get things done. So in closing, um, you know, going back to Major General Mohammed, he also said he hoped this workshop would energize us to do better. And I definitely kind of feel energized personally to keep on with this critical agenda. And I think hopefully you will do too. And thank you to the nearly 150 people who joined us. And I look forward to talking to you all and seeing you in the next Africa Network meeting soon. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Carly. Um, so once again, yeah, thanks everyone for joining. And I want to thank the team at UN Environment and the entire ITDP team that put in a lot of work to make this webinar possible. Um, you know, please follow ITDP and, and UN Environment on social media. We'll also send out the presentations and other, me uh, other materials for this session. Thanks everyone and, and bye for now. Bye. Bye. Bye.